Okay, so good morning. Uh, welcome to the third day of the BIM School. And uh, it's with pleasure that I announce the first speaker of this morning session, who is Arnau Montagut from the Barcelona Super Company Center in Spain. And uh, he will have his talk about sub level simulations. So, Arnau. Yes. Hi, everyone. Good morning. So, maybe we can sh shift to my computer. So I'll be talking today about uh, cell level cell level simulations. Um, so this talk was uh, planned to be given by uh, my PI Alfonso Valencia, but he had personal constraints and he couldn't he couldn't be here, so he excuses himself for for that. But yeah, let's. Let's see how this works out. So I come from uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center, which as its name says, it's in Barcelona in Spain. But before I was five years at Institut Curie in Paris. So uh, I was there in order to work on building uh, Boolean models uh, to have actionable um, gene interactions and actionable models in order to infer drug interactions, et cetera, on different kinds of, uh, of uh, cancers. So I worked on stochastic simulation and also multi-scale multi models. And then last January, I, I, I shifted to Barcelona, uh, to Alfonso Valencia's group, in which um, we try to develop multi-scale simulation tools in OA and to migrate this into HPC, to high performance computing. Uh, the idea is to work on the same multi-scale models that I worked before, but now working in, in this high performance computing uh, scenario. So here the goal would be to have uh, real size tumor simulations. So the idea is that we would start with few cells and then we would try to have like a real sized uh, tumor simulated with cellular heterogeneity, environmental heterogeneity, different cell types, hopefully cell, evolu cell evolution, so mutants, selection, etc. But yeah, this was a bit as introduction of uh, my, my recent path. So at BSC we host one of the supercomputers in Europe that is called Mario Nostrum 4. And it's a general purpose computer in the sense that, that several scientists use it. And, and in fact, from BSC, we are four different departments, very different departments. There is one that is earth science, the other is life science, and then there are two that are computer uh, science, one more, let's say, technical, and the other a bit more uh, scientific. Um, and apart from this Mare Nostrum 4, we have also um, some uh, quite different uh, technologies that they call emerging technologies that they were bought in order to evaluate if, if the following Mare Nostrum 5 would be, uh, would be in one of those different technologies or, or not. So the, here there is, one with, um, there is one cluster with GPUs and this one with NVIDIA and there's also with uh, uh, Knight 9, I think it's called, um, et cetera. So yeah, we have, we have a bit of diverse the different computers. Um, the thing is that the number one computer right now, it's in the US, that it's called Summit. And yeah, it beats, it beats Mare Nostrum for like, like in two orders of magnitude and, and it's, it's very nice and it have these 20, uh, 28,000 uh, GPUs and they do a lot of calculation there in the US. But the thing is that even though they may be number one, we are located in a chapel, which is nice. So this is 1940s chapel, so it's neo-Romanesque. Uh, neo I mean, it's not 20th century uh, Romanesque uh, chapel. But still, I mean, the, the Technical University of Catalonia decided to host the computer here, and this was, this was used as an, as an aula magna, I mean, like, like the room we're here right now. So, yeah, so this uh, scenery made that uh, some people were interested into working or, or, or yeah, being inspired by this by this computer. So in fact, if you happen to have read the last Dan Brown book, Origin, there is part of the action that is happening in the, in the computer. In fact, the current, the current director of the institute is a character in the book. So yeah, so he allowed, he allowed Dan Brown to be around in the institute for several weeks with the caveat that if they ever make a movie, he wants to start himself. But well. So yeah, so uh, apart from Mare Nostrum, the, the European infrastructure of HPC is quite uh, diverse, is distributed. So in fact, we have, we have one uh, here in Switzerland that is called uh, Daint, and we have uh, six others around, around Europe. It's Lugano, good. Okay, nice. Yeah, that would be nice, yes. So yeah, 
So uh, this distributed, uh, this distributed uh, idea of, of HPC, it's, it's uh, yeah, I mean, the thing is that if you distribute uh, resources, I mean, it's easier for, for people who to have close that resource to participate in this. So um, recently there was um, a call in order to, uh, to finance the following generation of, of supercomputers. And there were, as far as I know, there were three consortia. Uh, one that it's called, well, it, it was Finland and many, many other countries. I think among them uh, Switzerland, CSC, if I'm not mistaken. And there was another one with uh, Italy and Slovenia, which is, yeah, those two. And then there was another that it was, there was Spain, Portugal, uh, Turkey, Croatia, and I think also Ireland. So yeah, there was this call, and then uh, they were uh, so they 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 split the finance between between those consortiums so that each one of them could be could build uh, um, a pre exascale uh, computer. So we, with this new computer, where they, we would reach these 200 petaflops of, of peak for performance, which is more or less what they have in the U.S. right now. But I think the technologies here will not be GPUs; it will be uh, more CPUs. And, and then the idea here is to have this experimental platform to create supercomputer technologies in Europe, meaning like processors, et cetera, would be uh, at least designed in Europe. I don't know how that will work out, but yeah, let's, let's see how that works. So uh, we had the visit of our, of our uh, president in, in, um, at BSC, so we were full of policemen and military guys, et cetera, around the university, <laughs> around the center, and they were visiting the computer. In fact, this, the, the room you saw, this, um, this uh, crystal, crystal uh, uh, room that you saw, it's only open for kind of like these occasions or where maintenance is needed. I mean, you cannot enter into, the, into this, into this um, windowed uh, scenario. So yeah, the idea is that, okay, I mean, why are we investing so much into HPC or wh what is the need to invest so much in HPC? Well, this is, um, this is a correlation that, that came in, a, in an article, like, like paper, like, some weeks ago, some months ago, in which uh, there was the, they saw this correlation. I mean, of course, if you log if you log one of the one of the axes, of um, the number of petaflops per day that that artificial intelligence needed to be trained, and the um, and, and, and current, current on the time. So you you see that the more I mean, newest and newer uh, AI technologies need more petaflops per day. Here the thing is that I don't really know where's the causality. I mean, I mean, do they build AIs that drain the petaflops per day because they can, or we build computers in order to train those AI artificial intelligence. I mean, this is a correlation that, that I, honest, honestly, I don't know what is, what is the cause of it. But it's true that with bigger guns, of course, you may, you may be able to, to address bigger problems. <coughs> so, so yeah, so our gun, this uh, Mare Nostrum 4, uh, in fact, you can, you can access, you can access this in, in hours of computing. So there's this European uh, consortia in which you present a project, a scientific project, and they grant you several million hours of, of computing time. Um, there is also national, um, national consortium. So for instance, this is the Spanish consortium in which, again, you can, uh, you can propose uh, a scientific project and then it's evaluated and they give you some, some, million, some million hours in order to compute them. And this is us in the Institute. I mean, we only have 4% of, of computation time uh, allowed for, for the computer. So if we have big projects, we either have to ask the national, the national um, um, consortia or we have to ask PRAISE, which is the European one, in order to be granted several millions of hours. Else we have, we have access, but still, I mean, it's not, I mean, we cannot play uh, video games all day long with a computer. So, so yeah, so um, in, in part of um, Alfonso's group, we work on, on cancer. And I don't know how many of you here are biologists, but I will just have a brief introduction about uh, cancer and what kind of data we can find in, we can find in, in biology. So um, cancer, it's, it's, it's considered um, many diseases, so it's considered a syndrome in which multi -state, there's a multi-state process of abnormal cell growth. So there are several phases of, uh, from one cell that goes a bit nuts until you have a metastasis. And these phases are, are more or less defined in which um, so the, the, the cell just divides, it invades surrounding tissue, then it breaks the basal lamina, which would be like kind of the frontier of the tissue. It goes into the bloodstream and then it nests and starts a new metastasis somewhere else. So all of these, all of these uh, steps are governed by several hallmarks or so-called hallmarks of cancer that are uh, hallmarks that enable or don't prevent, depending on the hallmark, the spread and the nesting of, the, of, these, of these cancer cells. 
So in, in, in our case, we would, we would like to study several of these hallmarks, which are very characteristic. And in fact, they, they bring together several, uh, several specialists. I mean, from immunologists to doctors to biologists, et cetera. So um, there's this central dogma of, of molecular biology in which information is stored in the form of the DNA. It gets transcribed into RNA, and then it gets translated to proteins. And proteins are the elements of the cell that act in the, in the cell. So if you have, I mean, from, from enzymes, so from degrading and producing energy to structural functions, all, all of this is done by proteins. So this, uh, this information is stored in these in this nuclei and then in chromosomes, and then there is this DNA. So if you, if you want to study the, the DNA, you would be studying what is called genomics. So it's basically all the kind of information you can retrieve out of the DNA data. And uh, we call it genomics when you study all the DNA as a whole. I mean, like, like all the DNA present in a cell. Again, the same for the transcriptomics, which is in the case that you study uh, RNA. And then proteomics when you study proteins. But then there's also other kinds of, um, of omics that are not part of this central dogma, which is the case of metabolomics, uh, glycomics, lipidomics, etc. So the idea is that if you study all the elements of one of, one of these layer of elements of, of the cell, you would be studying kind of like omics data. So, um, of course, this omics data is different in different tissues, as you may guess. And interestingly enough, there is also a huge heterogeneity in, in how this tissue is developed. So it's not the same, the omics of a two-year, two-day born child than the omics you may get in adult, adult uh, bodies. So there is a huge heterogeneity in places and also in time. And ideally, you would like all of this heterogeneity to be captured in, in, your, in your analysis. So I guess everybody here knows that in 2000, 2001, there was this human, human genome project in which they decoded uh, all, the, all the DNA of, of the human, or they identify what pieces of the DNA were genes, more specifically. So I call this omics revolution that starts somewhat in 2000, 2001. And the idea was to bring together all the information for all the genes, so imagine that here you would have, uh, this is epigenomic, but well, you would have uh, um, different, uh, different conditions and you would have different genes and you would have expression of the different genes in different conditions. So these, uh, if you do for several layers, you would have like this multi-omics data in which you can integrate different, different layers of information. And I said here that it ended in 2016. In fact, it didn't end it. I mean, we still do genomics and we still do a lot of omics analysis. But the thing is that around 2016, there came another revolution called the single cell. So now what we do is we don't study the bulk of the tissue. So before this, you just took all the, all the tissue, all the liver. You would smash it and you would study RNA or you would study DNA, et cetera. But in this case, you study sing cell by cell. So if you have, if you, I don't know, if you have a, a tumor of 1,000 cells, if you are skilled enough in order for, this, for the surgeon, the surgeon is skilled enough to cut only the tumor, you would have 1,000 cells tumor and you would be able to identify the expression or the DNA of these thousand cells. So yeah, so this a bit changed uh, the mentality of, uh, of how people address this omics analysis in the sense that now we can go fine grain into what, is, what are the differences among cells. And in fact, they discover things quite, quite interesting as there's huge diversity that we just didn't know because we were studying before the mean or the median of the different expression of, this, of the cells, okay? So this address this idea of that not, not only you have difference in, you have heterogeneity in different tissues, but among tissues, you also have different, different uh, uh, a lot of the heterogeneity. In fact, not only in cell types, I mean, if you look at all the cells in one cell type, typically you would have also a high diversity, which is something that it was, it was not expected. So yeah, so if before it was complicated, now it's even more complicated. So this allowed to have this uh, kind of uh, this uh, human cell atlas in, you, in which you would you would be able to um, stratify or to or to identify the different sub subtypes of the of, of cells in, in one single tissue, and this opened the door to, to several to several analyses that was much more uh, more fi fine grade than than was done uh, before. But still, as I say, I mean um, omics as it used to be known or or as it is known didn't stop. I mean, we still have lots of genome projects worldwide in which the idea is to bring together uh, different, different thousand people or hundred people and then to have their, their DNA analyzed. So yeah, we're having, we're having these huge, vast amount of projects around the world. 
I mean, not only in Europe, we have some 19 genome projects, depending on the country. I think UK has four. Yeah. So, so um, the idea here is that we were going to have a problem in 2022 where we have one million genomes. So what do we do with this data? I mean, yes, we can analyze one by one, but then maybe there will be a point when we will need some kind of infrastructure to analyze this. <coughs> and talking about this infrastructure, there was um, there's this, um, this idea or this feeling that uh, medicine has like different P's. So they talk about preventive, predictive, participatory, and personalized medicine. But now we, we should also include a fifth P, which would be the platform medicine. I mean, you will need an infrastructure to hold all these data so that the doctor and the patient ideally have access to these data and they can talk together or, or how, how this uh, personalized uh, drug can affect you and not your neighbor, etc. So yeah, so this opened the way to, to personalized medicine in which we have vast amounts of data and we have to interpret the data and we have to make it understandable. I mean, it's not just because you gather knowledge that you get more information out of the knowledge. So this opened the door, for instance, to this very, very nice paper in 2015 by Segal Group, in which they, they uh, studied personalized nutrition and how different people eating exactly the same, they will have a different uh, um, uh, glucemic, uh, it was glucemic responses. So uh, this gives the idea that, that personalized information is very interesting in the sense that you can address different people needs in different ways which of course is something that we kind of like assumed, but now we have more proof in terms of, of omics data. There was also this paper by, by a Leroy Hood uh, group in which they uh, did a wellness study. They define wellness in the, in the paper, so don't, don't ask me what they consider or not consider wellness because I, I don't remember <laughs> right now, but the idea is that they took 108 individuals and they not only took uh, omics data, but they also took different, let's say, clinical data. I mean, what's their lifestyle and what did they do? If they do a sport, they don't, etc. And uh, they address how uh, these people could uh, be more happy or well in, in, nine month, in a nine month trial. And again, for uh, different people that, that more or less look or, or live the same lives, the, the recipes were different because of this difference in personalized, in personalized data. So, of course, BSC would like to be into this uh, precision uh, medicine, let's say, wave or field. And uh, they designed this strategy in order to, be, uh, to work on precision medicine, in which they partner with a lot of different entities, from uh, hospitals to um, cancer genomics institutes to uh, the genomic infrastructure uh, that we have in Europe, and also to the, um, to the technology transfer, which is mainly the guys that build the computers right now. And they, they would like to, to be in talk with all of, those, all of those people in order to have something that we could call clinical genomics. So, as I said, we need this infrastructure and we need to organize the data somehow. In order, I mean, the way we have to organize this data, we call it database, which is you just gather different kinds of data and you organize it in a different way. And you may like one database and you may not like another one, et cetera. And um, in this case, I want to just point out two different databases, that they are very different databases and, and their focus is, is different, but they are, they are equally useful. One is this International Cancer Genome Consortium, ICGC. I think it's hosted in somewhere in Canada, in which they, um, they, they, they just hoard all the data that, that can be available in, in terms of, of genomic, genomic data. So you have different cancer projects, you, have, uh, you can search by keyword. You can also analyze the data in this, in this portal. And uh, you can also access the data releases. So they do regular data releases that you can, that you can, that you can get. And uh, there is also the data repository, so meaning the raw data. And these you can address by uh, gene name, by mutation, by type of cancer. I mean, you can, uh, you can access the, the database in many, many ways. And it gives you all the information that, that it's available for this, for this, that is publicly available. I mean, here we're not talking if some companies have their own database. I mean, that we don't have access. But this is just for the, for the publicly available one. So this is a huge, a huge database in which you can access different data. And then another example of, of database that is also very useful is this um, senior database by the University of Rome, in which they, they call it Signaling Network Open Resource. So here the idea is to 
browse pathways and genes and look at, at interactions among genes and proteins. So they look for causality, what activates what, what inhibits what, which I find this very useful because it's not the same to look at a PPI network in which you know that yes, this, this activates, uh, this um, um, touches the other, the other protein, but also it's interesting to see if this is in an inhibiting interaction, if it's an activating interaction, et cetera. Of course, they grade, they grade the, different, um, the different evidences they have for the different interactions. So there are bigger evidences and there are uh, fewer evidences for, for a given, um, for a given uh, context. And um, yeah, I mean, for instance, we, we mainly use this resource in order to build Boolean models in which what you want to know is interactions of activation and inhibition of, of the different pathways and, and gene interactions. So, yeah, imagine that, imagine that you have thousands of, of data points um, for, for, a given, for, a given, um, for a given patient, and you have different, different layers of these data points. So for one single gene, you have the DNA mutation, you have the RNA expression, you have the protein expression, et cetera. So the way, the way we have to incorporate all these data into something that we can understand is to build networks is to build networks in which uh, gene A interacts with gene B. Maybe I don't know what is the interaction, but I know they interact. Or gene B inhibits gene C. I mean, these we build networks, and then from these networks, uh, we tried to model this, this interaction in order to, um, in order to, to have, a, have a result, and then to go to the experiment and see if the result is correlated with the, with the experiment. So for instance, the idea is that, okay, I mean, what happens if this beta catenin I mutated it and it doesn't work? What would happen to the cell? I mean, how would the cell behavior change? So, of course, I think this slide, I can, I, can, uh, I can just slim through it with this audience, but basically, the idea is that we build, we build models. So a model, uh, very briefly, a model is a very, very basic mathematical construction in which you have three elements. You have the input, you have the model, and you have the output. And like all mathematical constructs, you need to know two of them in order to know the third one. I mean, if you give me only the input, I have no idea what to model build because I don't know what you want as an output. If you give me only the model, I have no idea what you want as input and uh, what you want as output. So I need the input and the model in order to give you the output or vice versa. I mean, if I have input and output, you would do what it's called, I mean, what they call reverse engineering. I mean, from what you want and from what gets into the black box, I would, I would try to identify what goes into the model. So, of course, model is very interesting because it predicts behaviors, but it's not, only the on, it's not the only use we, we make out of the model. So, for instance, it helps us understand the system, identify blind spots, and be able to manipulate, and also to identify new hypotheses. I mean, the idea, as I said before, I mean, what happens if I mutate this? Depending on what interactions are affecting beta catenin, then I can, I can infer what will be the next experiment that my, my, that my colleague can do in order to contrast some hypotheses. So data leads to structure. I mean, depending on the kind of data you have, you would build one uh, network or another. So you would have, for PPA networks, you would have interaction networks. For uh, metabolic networks, you would have process descriptions. So I don't know, glucose goes degraded into these other things. You would have activity flows. If A touches B, then something happens and you would have also entity relationship for molecular interactions. So these different kinds of network would lead to different kinds of modeling. So for instance, uh, in interaction network, you would have, you, would, you could work with statistical modeling. With activity flows, you could work with logical modeling. So depending on the data I have, I can I structure it in, in, in one way or another, and I can apply several kinds of modeling into this, into this network. Or the other way around, if I want to model in a, certain, in a certain specific way, I will organize my data in a specific way. And all of those are equally valid. I mean, there's not one better than the other. I mean, depending on what you want, you use the tool you need. So yeah, so different, different biological knowledge will lead to different networks and will lead to different modeling. So <coughs> all of this is, is very, very nicely explained in this review by, by Nicolas Lenover. In which, in which he tries to organize, I mean, is basically where these figures in, are, are inspired from. He tries to organize what, what, what networks uh, we can expect in, in, in biological studies and what kinds of different simulations we can get or what kinds of different modeling we can get out of these, out of these, out of these networks. So yeah, a couple of examples. For instance, if protein mediates the degradation of protein B, you can, you can build it in different, in different ways. 
You can have a reaction network in which protein A gets produced and degraded and be the same, and then A affects the degradation of B. But you can also depict it in a very, very simple influence network. Protein A inhibits protein B. So you would call one would be, you would use differential equations to solve it, and the other you would, you would use logical modeling to solve it. And the same if you complicate a bit things. If X is activated by Y, and it is inhibited by Z, so an influence network would be like this, but then in reaction network you, have, you would have like different possibilities to model this. And again, this you would, you would model with logical modeling, and this you would use differential equations to, to solve it. So the, the question is not what are you going to use in order to solve something, but what do you want to study? I mean, I mean, are you more interested if Y and Z interact in the production or in the inhibition of Z, or you just don't care and you want a coarse grain um, model, and then you would go for the influence network? And as I said, I mean, both are equally valid as long as you're happy with them and as long as, as you have results that, that fits your need. So I was talking before about multiomics, which is our fancy word for saying that we consider several layers of this omics, omics data. <coughs> so multi, uh, multi layers allows to combine different, different levels of this multiomics data. So imagine that here we have a toy example of uh, four scientists in three conferences. So conferences are the different layers, so ECCS in 2013, a workshop in Oxford, and then another conference in 13. And each dot here are the different, are the different scientists, which are, I mean, they are basically four. So for one layer, you would have this intralayer edge in which you would connect the different, the different scientists into one of the layers. And you will also have interlayer edges. So in this case, you just connect YYYA and with with himself or herself, I don't remember if it was boy or girl. But um, here, um, the analysis that you can make is to look for communities. I mean, is this layer determinant in the, term, in the communities I, found, I find, or is this other layer explains some data that I have in this layer that I didn't know before, et cetera. So this can be also applied to disease, um, to disease networks in which you have electronic health records, you have transcriptomics, so RNA, you have different symptoms if patients share a given symptom, and you have microbiome. So the, the bacteria and, and, and yeasts that you have in your gut, which is what microbiome is. So you would be able to identify communities in one of those, in one of those layers, but also you would be able to know if, a, if another layer explains things in one layer that you just didn't realize. So this is what it's called multi-layer analysis and it's, it's quite fashionable lately. And uh, in biomedical multilayers uh, allow us to bridge the, uh, networks with different types of entities, which is very nice because sometimes we don't know how to, how to organize these, these different data. So for instance, you can have drugs with, imagine multipartite networks in which you have drugs that connect different patients. So you would know that C and A share a drug that was given to them or um, if they have a mutation that, that corresponds to the same disease, or the, if there is a pathway that connects different, different patients. And, and so these different layers allow you to combine uh, uh, data that was basically heterogeneous for you. <coughs> so um, Davide, Davide Cirillo, which is a postdoc at, at Alfonso's lab and his student ticket, um, apply, tried to apply this multi-layer multi analysis to the congenital myasthenic syndrome. Basically, what you need to know is that in this, in this uh, syndrome, you have different level of severity, and this affects greatly how, how this patient uh, develops. So they combine omics analysis, so different, uh, different DNA analysis, I think it's in, the case, yeah, in this case, and then created databases of causality of, um, of genes. So genes that are known to be causal of this, of this syndrome. So they apply this multi-scale functional analysis in order to find out modules of damaged genes. I mean, if you find a community that is typical of these severe patients and not typical of these non-severe patients. So here they play around with this, uh, in multi-layer analysis, they play around with this resolution parameter, which is how many communities you need, you, you want, or how many communities, the granularity of the communities you need. So the higher this uh, resolution parameter, you will have more communities with fewer genes. So you can restrict the level of connectivity among genes in order to have either one sparse big network or two, two very, very small, very, very condensed uh, network of genes. So of course, 
the, uh, the, the level of resolution that you need for your project depends a lot on the, on the technicalities of your project. In their case, they aimed for the higher resolution parameters. I mean, they wanted to know the highly connected uh, uh, genes or, or elements in their multi-layer multi network. So they started with this resolution, low resolution parameter, and then they increased the resolution parameter, and then they had a very, very condensed uh, uh, element of uh, genes, uh, gene network. And they find out that, effect, uh, that in fact, they, they were finding different, different, uh, different communities for different uh, patients, for different levels of patients. So severe, severe patients had like this community very, very connected, and non-severe had this other one. So there are some, uh, some genes that are, that are common, for instance, this LRP4 and this PLEC, but there are also the genes that are quite different between severe and non-severe. Of course, this, um, this, allows, this allows our clinician colleagues in order to, to study these other genes that maybe they, they just missed or they didn't, they didn't look at them, et cetera. So it's a way to, um, to offer new hypotheses that before it was, it was, not, uh, was not considered. So another way of, uh, of modeling that we have, that we have in, in, in biology is metabolic modeling. In here, the goal is to study what is the metabolism of the different kinds of cells and study how, um, how is it affected if a given mutant uh, uh, removes some reaction from the mix or, um, for instance, in biotechnology, how you can add reactions to a, given, to a given metabolic network in order to produce something that it was not produced before. So, for instance, antibiotics. That are, antibiotics usually are byproducts of yeasts but you can, you can promote the production of this antibiotic by removing several reactions or adding others, okay? So in our case, uh, there, is, there, is a very, there, is a, there is a nice correlation between cancer and, and metabolism, which is that when, when a cell starts dividing, the metabolism it does, it's kind of like half-baked metabolism. So in fact, it's called Warburg effect, in which what you do is, is the glucose that you usually would degrade totally, you just stop a lactate. So you, you drain out like 40% of the energy of the glucose. And this is done because the cell is so, I mean, wants to divide, well, doesn't want, but it needs to divide so much that it doesn't have the time and the patience in order to drain all the energy of this, of this glucose. So, I mean, there is, there is, um, there is interest in studying, in studying metabolism in, in cancer as well. So how do, we do, how do we do this metabolic analysis? First, we work with the network construction. So we take the genome of the cell and we, we retrieve all the genes that are part of the metabolic network, which call, are called enzymes. So we build this, uh, this network in which you have A is degraded to B, B is degraded to C, etc. Maybe it uses ATP or whatever. So once you have the list of genes in the genome, you can build such a stoichiometric matrix in which you organize in a sparse matrix what gets degraded and what gets produced. So it's, it's a matrix with lots of zeros and lots of ones and minus one and some two, and maybe a three, but maybe mainly zeros and ones. So the idea is that you want to know these here, X are metabolites, how metabolites change in time, which depends on this stoichiometric matrix, which looks something like this, and it depends on a flux vector. So all of these, these are reactions, and these are metabolites. And you would have, at the end here, you would have a vector in which it tells you how much flux goes into these reactions. So it's not only the psychometry of the reaction, but it's also how much flux you have in this, in this reaction. So um, the, the analysis that, it's, that is done since 98, 99, I think, first work where it's called flux balance analysis, in which you, uh, what you want to know is the information about the reaction fluxes. What is, what is my flux of these reactions? In order to do this, this is done in order to study the, the cell growth and also the metabolite productivity. As I said, if I have an antibiotic, that I can, I can enhance the production of this antibiotic. And uh, this flux balance analysis is considered part of the family of what is called constraint-based metabolic model, because you use constraints in order to reduce the solution space. So uh, yeah, you, had, you have this equation, you have this stoichiometric matrix, and maybe some of you have seen that you have many, many more metabolites than, than you have reactions. So in fact, what you have here is an endotermine system that you need to consider steady state in order to be able to address it. So the biological excuse you have to consider the steady state is that the time of the cell growth is much, is, is bigger than the time of the reactions. So you can apply steady state on the reactions in order to, to study the cell growth. 
So for you, the internal reactions will not accumulate. I mean, the metabolites will not accumulate or degrade because they will be on a steady state. So everything that is produced is degraded. And then you will study this cell growth. And then you will impose constraints, which is why it's called constraint-based metabolic model. <laughs> so as I'm not a mathematician, I prefer to see things graphically. So imagine that you have three fluxes and you have the possible, the possible solution space of these three fluxes. When you apply steady state and constraint, what you do is to have a convex hull in which you have the biological feasible solution space. So the thing is that you know that, uh, I don't know, a bacteria or a, or a cancer cell will not eat as much glucose as possible. I mean, you know there are some constraints there, there are some biological constraints. You know that the transporter has a rate, transporter for a given cofactor has a rate. So you know that you have another biological constraint there. So you apply many of those constraints and what you do is you reduce a solution space to the biological, biologically feasible solution space. But then the problem comes that when your biological friends tells you, okay, but I want a solution. I don't want a space of solutions. Give me one solution. The thing is that you say, okay, I mean, let's see, let's see if, if biology is optimized for something or bacteria are optimized for something, it will be to grow. So you imagine that the, optimiza the optimization of growth would be one of those, one of those points. So the idea is that a bacteria, in, if it has enough, enough glucose, cofactor, et cetera, the optimal thing that it will do would be grow. I mean, it will grow until, until it divides, and then it will grow until it divides, et cetera. So uh, this allows you to give like this one solution with one flux vector, which is the maximal amount of growth that the bacteria could, could do under, under this specific condition. So this can also be explained in the same network that we saw before. So we have things that go in, so metabolites that go in, let's say glucose, cofactors, et cetera. You have some interactions inside and you have some end points of the metabolism. So you build up this biomass equation that it's also ideal. I mean, what is a biomass is basically the number of moles you have of each one of the elements. And you optimize for this biomass equation. And you see these fluxes, you see that the arrows have changed uh, uh, thickness. So you would, you, would be, you would identify what fluxes or what reactions have more flux and what reactions have less flux. And now if I say, okay, but imagine that I want to take this one out. What, what can I do in order to maximize the flux here? Maybe you can kill this reaction here. So maybe all these flux will go to this flux, to this metabolite, things like that. Of course, usually biology is not as easy as to just, you just cut and it works. I mean, usually you have to go trial and error, trial and error, but well, you have to start somewhere. So the difference between constraint-based modeling and kinetic modeling would be that with kinetic modeling, you would have a unique point. I mean, given a set of parameters and a set of values of the different fluxes, you would have one unique point. The thing is that we don't have this complete description. I mean, I would like to, but we don't have. I mean, you don't have all the parameters for the 4,000 reactions of the metabolic models. So what you do is, with, com with incomplete information, you work with this solution space. And then you explain yourself that, yeah, okay, maybe solution space is not ideal. Let's find an objective function. And let be this representative function growth. Sometimes the objective function can be adaptation, not growth. I mean, it depends on, on what your problem is. So once you have done this metabolic model, um, yeah, I mean, there comes, there comes someone and says, okay, but, but not all cells have the same metabolism, which is true. So um, in a recent paper, well, recent, some years ago paper from, from Nielsen Group, they integrated different omics data, so different levels of these, of these uh, cell-wide data into these metabolic models. So they try to identify uh, sub-networks and, and how different different uh, metabolic models were according to what kind of input data they had. So they had different tissues for different patients and using the same model, they contexted the model, I mean, they specify the model, they personalize the model to these different, kind, different tissues and the different patients. So at the end, what you have is an ensemble of models that they more or less, those ones more or less look similar, they're more, they're these look similar, there will be differences among them and there will be a lot of differences among the, different, among the different tissues. So of course, with different data, you can constrain differently different models so that you would have different results. Yeah, so the different uses that constraint-based uh, applications have in, in biomedicine are many. I mean, I have already talked about production of byproducts such as antibiotics or imagine having flavored synthetic milk. 
<coughs> and you would have also data integration, study of growth, then knockouts, meaning removing reactions of, uh, from, from this model, etc. So, uh, in fact, these, uh, all these um, constraint-based modeling started in bioreactors. I mean, in fact, the first, the first guy that studied this in biotechnology were chemical engineers. And they wanted to know what is, what, if my flux input and my flux output of the bioreactor, bio I mean, how much dollars I can get out of one kilo of, of sugar, basically. And from this, we got uh, constraint-based modeling and flux balance analysis. Okay. So let's go to logical logical modeling. So logical modeling, we we I mean I've been using quite quite a lot in the last in the last years, um, and it's it's kind of formalism that that allows for the questions to be qualitative. I mean, like like. Is this, I mean, if I do this mutant, is it going to be higher, increase the growth of the cell or increase the, or decrease the growth? It's also useful when the data, when the data is discrete. For instance, we have this kind of data in, in biology. For instance, mutants, copy number variations, etc. Also, when the expression data that we have is not absolute values, which is also what happens in biology. We usually correlate to a normal tissue. So you have that cancer tissue has increased gene or decreased gene according to a normal tissue. And then uh, another thing that we don't have in biology is information over time, which is also good for this logical formalism. And then, as I said before, I mean, if you have a couple of reactions that you have all the parameters, I mean, it's very nice to work on kinetic modeling. But then when you work with all the genes in your network, you usually don't have this amount of parameters. So when you don't have details, logical formalism can, can give you a hand on this. So let's go, let's go very briefly into what, what we, I mean, how we work on, on with Boolean logic. We usually start with a regulatory graph. So in this, in this toy model, you would have three genes, A, B, and C. And then A is activated by C. So whenever C is present, it will make A active. And B inhibits A, and A activates B. So each variable here can take zero or one. So it's either activated or inactivated, or present or absent. And then uh, you would build the, this relationship between in the regulatory graph. You would build it using Boolean logic. So you would have Boolean gates, such as and, or, not, x, or, etc. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, so then the, the logic depends on the incoming arrow. So if you say that if C activates A, I would say that C is an input, and then A is activated by C. So A is 1 whenever C is 1, and B is not present. And here B will be on whenever A is on. So the idea is that you integrate these different arrows that come to A into one equation such as this one. Okay? So once you have the logical rules and once you have the logical, um, the logical, the regulatory graph, there is, I mean, these logical rules are a set of discrete variables that are the abstraction of the activity of A, B, and C. I mean, of course, we know that in, in biology, things are not zeros or ones. But sometimes you have a high level and sometimes you have a low level. So you can consider that this low level is zero and this high level is one. So once you have, as I say, once you have the regulatory graph and the logical rules, you can, you can study the solutions of this graph. So you work on the state transition graph, which is, so if A, B, C, if you have values for A, B, C, that would be like this one, zero, zero. So th this first one is A, the following is B, and the following is C. You can study if we start at 1, 0, 0, so meaning A is 1, B is 0, C is 0, how this evolves, how the model evolves. So this state transition graph, what it says is that you have two solutions, which we call attractors, and they are a subgraph of this state transition graph. So they can be either stable states or they can be cyclic attractors. So stable states, you have this case is 0, 0, 0. Imagine that you have this 1, 0, 0. So what can happen if 1, 0, 0? You go to 1, 1, 0, you go to 0, 1, 0, and then B inactivates A, and you go to 0, 0, 0. But if all of them are, are, are activated, what you end up is in a, cyclic, in a cyclic attractor, and you will not get out of this. Okay, so we have two kinds of solutions, stable states and cyclic attractors. In our case, the stable states is what we call phenotypes, cell behaviors, cell fates. So it can be growth, death, apoptosis, et cetera. And then the updating dynamics in order to solve this can be either synchronous 
all variables are, that can be updated are updated or asynchronous. We update one, one um, uh, variable at a time, which is what you just saw here. Here we update only B, here we update only A, and here we update only B. In synchronous, you would go from this one to this one, that's it. Okay. <coughs> so two examples of, here I have depicted two models that we have worked on when I was, when I was at Curie. One is uh, TNF response and cell fates. So the inputs are here in yellow. So you have two, three different uh, proteins as inputs, and you have three different phenotypes as outputs. Subtypes are survival, so the cell grows. Uh, necrosis, which is a kind of cell death. And apoptosis, which is a programmed cell death. So the cell just commits hierarchy. And then uh, we have another, another uh, model here in which we have two inputs, which is extracellular microenvironment. So if the cell touches the matrix, then things happen. And we have also, this is DNA damage, yes. If the DNA of the cell is damaged. And then you will have a combination of effects, and then you will have different phenotypes as outputs. So for instance, we have metastasis, we have migration, invasion, and apoptosis. Again, the, the programmed cell death. So how, how do we build these networks? I mean, usually what we do is that we start with a question. I mean, what do we want to model? We want to model the effect of TNF, which is here. What effect TNF has in cell survival or cell death? So we start, we start by, by working, okay, I mean, what is known in the field about TNF? And you know that TNF affects RIPK1 and TNF affects also CASP3 CAPS uh, through disk. So you start little by little building this network. And then you look, you look at the different activation, activation arrows. And sometimes the network is a bit more dense, sometimes it's a bit more light. I mean, this is not good or bad. I mean, it's just the model answers a question. If the model answers your question, it's a good model. Else it's not a good model. <coughs> and of course, when we try to publish these models, we get the question, okay, but why didn't you focus on this part? Well, the thing is that if I focus on this part, I have to unfocus other parts that I don't want to unfocus, okay? So um, this kind of modeling is a convenient way to model regulatory and signaling net, uh, networks. Because what we work here is in, in what happens when the cell connects to something that is in the environment or to an extracellular matrix that it touches or when there's DNA damage inside the cell. And then this, the, pro, the, the solution of this is qualitative analysis. I mean, you end up with the, the, the model having survival, having uh, different kinds of death, or having metastasis, et cetera. I mean, the result here is behaviors. It's one or zeros in, the, in phenotypes. So yeah, what are the different questions that we can ask, or that we can ask the model? For instance, is um, yeah, what, what, of, what, what part of the solutions can be interpreted biologically? Ideally all of them, because you usually start with a biological question. Then what are the important nodes? I mean, you can, you can affect the different nodes of the, of the network, and you can see how robust or how sensitive the different nodes are, and if you can predict genetic interaction. So what happens if I mutate, I, I take out two of the different genes? I mean, maybe if I take one of them, the, the signaling can go through another path, but if I take another path, maybe the signaling just stops and then I kill the cell, whatever. So um, the stable attractors that we find in, for instance, in this TNF model are the ones that are depicted here. So here in rows, you have the different variables of the, of the model, and in different columns are the different stable states. Here I depicted stable states, not cyclic attractors. So you have, for a given combination of inputs, you will have different combinations of outputs of different, of different stable states. And depending if I, activate, if I activate a node or not, I mean here zero would be empty and one will be full, uh, full circle. So depending on the activation, uh, the activation status of inputs and intermediate, intermediate uh, variables, I will have some outputs here. And here to make it easy, I have organized the different, uh, different stable states into the different phenotypes. So I call this survival, I call this apoptosis and this necrosis. Okay, so, so yeah, this, this is kind of like a static way of studying, of studying Boolean models. But there's also a probabilistic way to study this. So in 2000, 2012, um, uh, from, from the group I was at in, in Curie, they work on this um, continuous time Markov process on the state transition graph. 
So here is the idea is that imagine that you have a toy model, for instance, this one with ABC, and you build a transition graph of this, of this toy model. And you have something like this, in which imagine if, imagine that all of three start at one, you will end up eventually at zero, zero, zero. In fact, no matter where you start in this transition graph, you will end up in zero, zero, zero. So the, the idea of this uh, Markov process is to associate a probability to each Boolean state. And this probability is driven by a parameter of one variable to go up or one variable to go down. So depending on the value of the parameter, it will be easy to take one path or to take another. Imagine that you have a split, a split path. If the probability of one is, is higher than the other, you would take that one, usually. I mean, if you run this for several trajectories. So then you have a rate of change associated to each transition. So now we can work on stochasticity, you can work on time or pseudo time, and you can work on probabilities. So you can, you can study how, uh, how many iterations you need to go to survival and how many iterations you need to go to apoptosis. And sometimes a trajectory would go to apoptosis even though the inputs are pro-survival because it needed the last steps and the rates were equal, whatever. And now you can also perturb this model in a probabilistic manner. So you can take out uh, uh, a node or you can reduce the rate, a given rate of a given variable and then you see how this perturbation affects the different trajectories. So if you want more information, you have these, um, these two papers on, on uh, this tool called uh, Mavos, in which that they are, they are very, very, nicely, very nicely written and, and, and very nice to read. And yeah, so these ads that they mentioned, or these ads that they mentioned into Boolean modeling, in which we can work about, we can talk about probabilistic uh, Boolean modeling. So usually the stochastic simulation starts with the definition of a given input. So you would have 50% nutrients, 50% androgens, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then you build a state transition graph, and then uh, in which you have these rates and you have this fixed amount of time. So you have, um, yeah, you have equal probability of going, of going for different rates if the rates are the same. And then you do this stochastic trajectory 1,000 times or 10,000 times or 100,000 times. And then you end up with phenotypes having a given probability of, reaching, of being reached. So um, you, you run several trajectories and you see that 10% of trajectories ended up in apoptosis or, or 23 in proliferation, whatever. And of course, if you apply mutants, so if you force one node to be zero or if you change the rates, these probabilities will change, okay? So these can be studied in two ways, as time trajectories or as population dynamics. So imagine that here I have, the only thing that I have changed is the inputs. So here, all the inputs are, have random initial conditions. So whenever a trajectory starts, it can have these three inputs can be zero or one. And in this one, what I have forced one of those three to be one. So what I see is changes in behavior. So here in red, we have apoptosis, this uh, um, um, cell death. And in green, what I have is proliferation. So you see that here proliferation is higher than apoptosis, but if I force these initial conditions to one, then apoptosis takes over. And I can study this with uh, the, pro the, the uh, added probability in each time step, or I can just take the last time step and study in pie chart form, what are the proportions of my probabilities. And I see that here apoptosis is only 34, but here it has jumped to 69, just by changing initial conditions. So, of course, in this case here, what we're doing is that we're, we're um, reducing the amount, so, if you remember this, if I take FAD as one, I only retrieve these, in these stable states that have FAD as one. I mean, if I force a given input, I reduce the number of stable states that I have. But you can also, you can also do a bit more fine grading in order to change these, these different rates in, in order to have different, more, a bit more complicated um, uh, trajectories or proportions. So another example of, of Boolean model comes from, from colleagues of us in, in Norway. So what Osmond wanted in this model was to have a model of gastric cancer cell and to have different nodes that were targeted by different drugs. So uh, this is a model that, that it has some uh, 30 nodes, I think, and it has two readouts, which is pro-survival and anti-survival, things that promote growth and things that inhibit growth. And this, in this case, these nodes here are multi-valued, so they have zero, one, two, three value, okay? 
So this would be logical modeling, but non-boolean, in the sense that it's not restricted to zero or one. So what Osman wanted to see is what happens if I combine different drugs? What is the predicted growth of my model? So here three would be full uh, pro-survival, and uh, minus three would be full anti-survival. Okay, so it's, it works with three, two, one, zero, and then minus one, minus two, and minus three. And he compared this to the observed, um, to the observed growth of this cell line with these, with these drugs. And he saw that, that there are some that were, uh, the synergy of the drug was predicted and it was, it was observed in, in the cell line, and others that was not the case. So for instance, this one, he predicted that interaction that didn't happen. So one of the things that we wanted to do with, with Mabos is to, this was done purely with the solution of these nodes. So he just subtracted these two nodes in order to have this, val this table here. So uh, what we wanted to do is to have this in a bit more probabilistic manner using, using Mabos. And what we saw is that we, we basically reproduce his, um, his results. But more interestingly now with, uh, with Mabos, what we, what we could do is the dosage, uh, um, dosage runs of this, of this model. So we would increase bit by bit the drug dose of one of, the, one of these drugs and also of the others. And you would see which one of the drugs dominates the other or which one, or if, if there is interaction. So with this, you can also do Bliss independence analysis on, on, on in the same manner. So for instance, you see that in, in this case, the, the connection of beta catenine with TAG1, both of them are equally, are equally dominant. I mean, you see that, you see only see the, the anti-survival when, when you have, um, when you have, uh, sorry, beta catenine. Well, in the others, there's only one of them that, that are taking, they taking the lion's share. So depending on, on how you want to study this, this model, this, this tool allows you to study a bit more uh, fine grain. And now, for instance, you can study these different activation strength in which you can uncover drug synergies using bliss independence or whatever. And then here you can focus on, on possible drug resistance mechanisms because in fact, you can see how this trajectory shifts for uh, in, in one of the paths of the state transition graph. And then again, yeah, the, which drug drives the, the model response. Okay. So. Okay, so I think I will shift through this part and, and focus on the other. I think this one we can, we can focus a bit more this, this afternoon. But here the idea is that uh, using a bit, a, a bit in, the same, in the same way that they did before with metabolic, metabolic modeling and omics data, here what we do is that we specify the different Boolean networks with patient data. So we take, we take omics data, we take a, a biological knowledge that we build into a model, and we personalize this model in order to have patient-specific patient -specific models. So let me, let me skim through it, but we work on three, on three variables. Which you, one is the node state, so if the node is zero or one, that we usually uh, adequate to mutants, or we think of these as mutants. Different initial conditions, that we think of it as growth media conditions, or given experimental setup. And then also the transition rates of this state transition graph. So the gene ability to activate or deactivate. So depending, depending on what variable we want to touch, we use different, different data, like copy number alterations or expression data. And this was published in January this year. And we end up with a set of, of ensemble of models in which we have used different recipes for each one of the patients. And we correlate the, for instance, proliferation score with a given experimental, experimental data of the patient that we have not used before in the model. So this is, this is, our, validation, this is our validation in terms of, okay, I have the, here different combinations in different variables. Which one correlates bet, best with the proliferation of this patient, of, of, of this data? And then here we select, uh, we select, okay, I mean, in this case, this one looks best, better than, than this other one, et cetera. So we can, we can select different recipes for different, for different patients. And then we can correlate it with, uh, with biological, um, with biological uh, replicates, et cetera. Yeah. And then we can also do survival, survival analysis, grouping patients by the outputs of the model. So if you have uh, the output of the proliferation score of the model, you take the median, and you see that the, the high proliferation patients have worse outcome than, the, than, the, uh, than, than those that are not. And the reverse for the apoptosis. High apoptosis means, means that the patient is likely to, to live. And it, this comes out of the model outputs, not of the input data. 
but okay, let me, this we will see, this, is, this we will see this afternoon because I want to focus now on, on agent-based modeling. So um, agent-based modeling, um, it's, it's quite ubiquitous uh, kind of modeling that you can find in, in several, in many different areas of, of knowledge in which they, they work with agents and there's these heuristics that there are by decision, made by decisions. And then there's an interaction topology of these, of these different agents. And you also have to apply some kind of description of the environment, how the agents are going to, are going to interact with a different environment. So there, as I said, there are many, many examples. They work on, on ecology in terms of, okay, I mean, simulating um, tree growth in, in forests, or uh, I think this was, um, I think this was spread of some kind of virus or something. And then they also work on, on um, this was um, liver, liver regeneration. So how the liver cells colonize whenever there's a, there's a need for them to, to grow into, into a full liver, this tissue biology. So in our case, we have, um, we use uh, different, these agent-based approaches are different. And in our, in our case, we use these overlapping spheres in which we consider that cells can overlap with other cells which of course, I mean, we could have used other. For instance, I know that for the wings of, uh, of, um, the wings of insects, uh, several people work on vertex modeling and they, they look at what are the tensions in the vertex, et cetera. <laughs> but in our case, um, we decided to work on these overlapping spheres in the sense that sometimes we can determine different, different levels of the different of, of cells and we can ideally, uh, think of this as an ideal uh, interaction between cells in the, in, uh, I mean, when, when, they, when they attach to each other, they attach usually not in one point, but they attach like in one, in one, um, in, yeah, in one line, etc. So this uh, agent-based model is a class of computational models, and yeah, and it can be used to simulate the actions and interactions of, of different autonomous agents. So in our case, agents are cells, cancer cells in this case. So uh, we used this um, work from Paul Macklin in Indiana University that is called PhysiCell, the, the tool, in which is a, this is an open source physics-based simulator for multicellular systems. So the idea is that you start up with a bunch of cells, in this case 18,000, and you let it grow with different rules and different heuristics. And then uh, in this case, at uh, 14 days, there's uh, these, um, this is immune, immune cells that, that, that occur, that happen in the, in the environment, and then they start eating the, eating the tumor and then leaving only the resistant, the resistant clones. So what we wanted to do is to take this, um, this fizzy cell and integrate, oh, sorry. So the basic, the basic cell agent has different properties, such as um, cell volume. So you have volume for the nuclei, which is the internal part of the cell, and then the volume for the cytoplasm. You have different positions, so you know where the cell is and what neighborhood the cell has, and the environment. You define some kind of environment by field or work by, by, passive, by passive agents, etc. You have also an internal state, which can be the cell phase, the growth rate, or a custom phenotype, which is in fact where we connect our tool. And then uh, you, have, you have an environment, which is divided by voxels. So this environment can be a 2D monolayer, so single cell monolayer or it can be, uh, it can have 3D shapes. So spheroid, ductal, or whatever, whatever shape that you want, you want to apply. So there are, there are different mechanics and, and diffusion that governs the different, the different cells and environment in which they are, they are determined by different, different equations. And the cells can affect, can affect the presence of these diffusible elements. So the cells can eat elements that are diffusible and they can produce them. And the same for the environment. The cells can produce a given, a given, uh, um, sh a given environment or they can eat the different environment. So this environment can be dynamic and it can be also reactive. So we have reaction diffusion equations that are governed by partial differential equations. And you have also a physical environment that it's our surrogate for this extracellular matrix, the one that surrounded the, the cancer tumor, in which you can have fields with densities that can be produced and consumed. And you can have also inert agents that can be moved, they can be pushed by, by the cells. And then, uh, yeah, of course, these reaction diffusion networks, equations, lead you to, to have uh, different gradients of chemical factors depending on how they interact with the cells. <coughs> so the simulation workflow, uh, usually um, you start with, uh, you first update diffusion, so you have different time steps for the different elements. So we call this multi-scale modeling in the sense that 
it has different scales of time. So in this case, we have three, and then we added a fourth one in the following slide. In, first, we have the diffusion, the diffusion of, of, the, of, the, of whatever it's in the, in the environment. We have also mechanical, mechanical time scales, and then we have cell processes. And each one of those, of those three have different time steps, and it has different uh, time frequency, and it's updated differently. So the idea we had in, uh, a couple of years ago was to use this as a genotype to phenotype model. This is a very, very fancy way of saying, I want to uh, model what happens inside the cell and outside of the cell, and I want the phenotype, what I see, or the output of the, cell, of the, of the model, to be a, a different cell behavior. So ideally, we would have like a mix of elements into this multi-scale model, and then we would have a, a different, different behaviors of the cell, and collective behavior. I mean, not only cells moving or not, but also attaching to each other or interacting in different ways with the environment. Okay, I mean, this was, this was our goal. So the idea was to integrate this uh, Mavos probabilistic Boolean tool into this um, physicel agent-based tool so that, the, that the, the agent would move or would attach depending on the, of, of the gene expression that it has inside or depending on what happened before and what kind of mutations it would have. So for this, uh, very cleverly, we, we uh, uh, added the boss to the fizzy part. So we have fizzy boss out of fizzy cell. Yeah, I didn't make the name, sorry. So the idea here is to have a fizzy cell extension that includes cellular signaling. So we would have fizzy cell already had interaction with the microenvironment. I mean, this was solved by fizzy cell. And we added the internal signaling. So now what happens inside of the agent depends on a Boolean network that is inside the agent and depends on what happens in the, in the environment. And this, uh, with this, we can combine studies of what happens if I perform a mutation and at the same time I change the environment and see if this correlates or not. So now in each one of the cells, so for instance, these green cells are cells that are going to divide and these red cells are cells that are going to uh, the program cell death, this apoptosis. Depending on what, on, on, on what happens inside of the cells, you would have different phenotypes. So for instance, if TNF is active, it will, it will uh, provoke survival, survival of the cell. If FAD is active, it will go to apoptosis, etc. So imagine that you have here TNF in the environment and here you have FAD. Depending on what the cells touch, you would have a, a access, that you would have different, different behaviors. And of course, you know, in order to have this, we added this fourth time scale that is called the signaling time, uh, time scale. So we integrated uh, uh, Mavos into, into PD cell, and this way we can represent different cell strains. So cells that have different biology, so you can have wild type and mutants, or you can have patient-specific networks, or you can have also different physical properties. So it can be different strains of cells that attach to their neighbors in different ways, or that attach to the matrix with different adhesion. Ideally as well, you could have tumor heterogeneity, Imagine that, that you have this, uh, you have a molecular clock in which at uh, 10 time steps, you have a gene that, that mutates. You could be able to trace tumor heterogeneity with this. You could, be, you, you could see how well the cell, the cell mutations uh, cause the different strains to adapt to different environments, et cetera. And yeah, so also, uh, as I said, we have also dynamical, dynamical environments. So depending on the presence or absence of, uh, of sensitivity to oxygen, you would have different, different cell growth. And you would, this would affect differently, maybe different cell strains. And you can also have different tumor architectures. You can have uh, the, the extracellular matrix is inert, inert agents around the tumor, or it can be regular shapes, like this cigar shape, et cetera. And also what you can have is this, this, the presence in the, of the TNF in the environment can be dynamical in the sense that you can have pulses of it. So this was a very nice, a very nice experiment that we did that was not having like a constant presence of TNF, but having like each 150 minutes, I think it was, uh, having a pulse of TNF and see what happens. And in fact, what happens is that when you don't have TNF, you have the, the tumor just grows. When you have a dose of TNF, the tumor first goes down and then it, 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 it becomes resistant to the TNF. If you add more TNF, the same behavior happens. If you just add it constantly, the same. The thing was that with pulses, we, could, we were able to reduce the proliferation rate of this tumor. 
So we would have that the necrosis, that the necrosis cells, which are the black ones, are overtaking the proliferation state. So we're killing the tumor in a sense. And it doesn't, it, doesn't depend, it doesn't depend that much on the concentration, but much more on the frequency that this happens. Which, which was a very, nice, a very nice conclusion that sometimes the recipe you give to the given tumor is not only, not only quantity of drug, but also how this recipe is given. Okay, well, this, what, what it was pictured was basically the, the video of this graph, in which you see that the, that the, that the black cells are taking, are taking over, over the green and the red. So you still have this pulse of apoptosis, and then um, the apoptosis, they have a very, very fast first uh, state in which they, they, they shrink, and then they stay shrink for, for a long time, which is why you have, you have this long queue. But then you see that the, that the black ones are taking over the, the green ones. Sorry for the video, maybe this afternoon we're able to see them. But also you can have different, different other examples of physipose use. So for instance, we can have different cell strains. You can have, so this comes from the same, from the same simulation that the following slide. And you can have also interaction with extracellular matrix. So this is the 2D monolayer of cells in which cells are migrating through the, um, through the monolayer. So if everything goes okay this afternoon, we will be able to simulate this one and the one, and the one in the, in the previous slide. So, um, yeah. Oh, good. So the difference perspective that, that we have with, this, uh, with these uh, Fizibos tools is uh, to integrate different kinds of cells. So not only to have cancer cells, but to also have immune cells, stromal cells, etc., into this mix, and then have some heuristic in, in how they interact with the different tumor cells. And another thing that we're, that we're uh, working with, um, with the guys at Indiana is to have um, the interaction of these, of these immune cells with the tumor to, I mean, to involve also immunologists in the mix. I mean, not, not just browsing widely into all the, you know, to all the possible interactions, but to, to, look, at, yeah, to look at something that, that they, they are interested in. Another uh, one collaboration we have with the uh, Gen Tartaglia group at uh, CRG is to have a Markov chain cell cycle of the cells. So currently, um, the cell cycle in, um, in physical cell is governed is basically a clock. I mean, you wait a given amount of time, you divide. You wait a given amount of time, you divide according that there are, there are no inputs that, avoid, that, that prevent you from dividing. This, uh, we, we thought of connecting it with the Boolean, with the Boolean network, and that, that the world also have some rates into this cell cycle, that it would be much easier to go from one cell cycle to, from one cell cycle phase to another than, than other. Uh, one thing that we're, that we're working in collaboration with the Department of, of Operations in BSC is to uh, jump to MPI with this, with this, uh, with this tool, with Physibus. So currently we can, we can work with OpenMP, meaning that we can take all the processors in one node, which is okay, I mean, it's nice. We can have simulations of over 100, 120,000 cells. But ideally we would like to, to have a shared memory between nodes in order that from few cells, we would have billion cell simulation. And for this would take, of course, time, but, but of course we have to share information among nodes, which is not trivial. So yeah, we're, uh, well, they are refactoring parts of the different code in order to uh, implement this, this MPI. Then um, uh, Miguel, uh, Miguel Ponce de Leon is working on integrating, integrating uh, metabolic modeling into, into these agents, in which right now what we have is we have a, a, volume, a volume growth that uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's just, uh, um, it's just a function of time. So you wait, you wait enough time, you grow, and then when you reach a critical, a critical volume, you just split, and then you have two daughter cells. So his idea was to integrate into each one of these agents to integrate a, a metabolic model that correlates with the input fluxes, so glucose, oxygen, whatever. It has also excretion fluxes, so you can produce things, like I said before about the lactate in the Warburg effect, and this would tell um, the, the, agent, the agent how much it has to grow, if it has to grow, okay? <coughs> so yeah, 
and skip. And yeah, so this was, this was the first presentation of today. So um, acknowledgements to my colleague, Miguel Ponce de Leon, which uh, he authored many of the slides I have presented today, which is here. And he's working also in this um, FBA for agents. Of course, uh, Valencia, and then from a, from a previous group, I also took several slides from, from Laurence and from Jonas. And then Gaël, Gaël Le Tour was the main developer of, of Physibos, which now she moved to Collège de France. And yeah, so this list of collaborators that we have had in, in these uh, few years. And then if you have any doubts or comments or questions, I will take them now. So now, thank you for your brilliant presentation, and we have time for questions. So, guys, don't be shy. I have one for you. <laughs> w which part you under understood best and, and the least? <laughs> really good Very question. Good. Very good <laughs> question. Yeah. Okay. Neither one? <laughs> <laughs> so I have two technical curiosities. Yeah, uh, one regarding the second part of your presentation, so your agent-based mod yes. models. Yeah, how can you convert the information, for instance, of the presence of TNF or a drug into your system to a different cell evolution? Yeah, that, that's a tricky question because when you go to biologists, they just say, we don't know. Oh. So the thing is that, okay, I mean, what is the amount of the internal concentration of TNF that triggers a response? And say, well, we don't know. I mean, we know the external part, but we don't know the transporter. So you, you can know more or less the, 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 what, what is in the outside part of the cell, but then the problem is, is how much you integrate into the cell. So in fact, one, one, of, the, one, of, the, one of the projects that we had with them is, okay, I mean, let's, let's make that a study. So let's see what the transporter has to be for that with a given amount of, of external TNF to look at what is the internal, the internal concentration that triggers the, the, the response. And then also, in the network, it's a TNF, it's tricky because it causes survival, but it can also cause cell death, depending on the internal state. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, it's not an easy experiment to do. So, so they said, okay, yeah, good. <laughs> Thanks for the question. <laughs> and um, a second one regarding the first part, because, of course, many, uh, many diseases do not depend on just on the expression, yes. or different level of expression of a protein, yes. but also of... Um, on mutations, so yes. can you include this information? Can you predict, for instance, this from your model? Yes, or? so um, in fact, the, the all, all this Boolean modeling uh, uh, aim was in order to study this. Okay. To say, okay, I mean, what mutation can I apply to the system in order to have a different behavior? So this, this started with uh, uh, P53, with it, which is a cancer, an oncogene in, in, in mice, so many, many years ago. Uh, they, they started with a project like, okay, I mean, what do I have to mutate in order to produce cancer in mice with, with, these, uh, with these genes? And then also look at the cascade of these effects. So it's not only you mutate, you mutate uh, a P53, but it has some effects in the cell, and they wanted to capture this. So in fact, the, I mean, one, one, of the, one of the aims of, of Boolean modeling is to reduce hypothesis test testing. So, I mean, you talk with the biologists, and they say, okay, we're working on these three or four pathways. You say, okay, I mean, I know I have to integrate these four. Let's see if there are connections among them. And let's see if, if I can provide you with a list of short list of, of experiments for you to perform. Okay, great. And, and these, these work quite well, in fact. Great, so no more questions? Okay, if, if that's not the case. Oh, yes. Okay. Uh, again, about the last part of your presentation. I mean. Um, you can work at a single cell level. I mean, yes. for example, if you want to simulate the neurons that are a quite complex cell, so you can really have um, an idea about the shape and how the, the, the cell, using the, the same approach, I mean, the, the, the same. You could. So, uh, I mean, right now we are we're constrained by, by spheres in, in, our, in our agents, but you, <laughs> could, you could couple agents. So imagine that, that you, you could couple agents into the shape, the shape you want. So these people do, I mean, they do like, like two, three spheres into one like cigar shape, kind of, sort of meta cell or, or cell, 
And this you could do, you could do for neurons, you could do for different shapes. I mean, it's a bit tricky because you have, you have to, you have to, uh, I mean, you have to have rules for how they transport things in internally, okay. which is different, let's say, wagons of the train. But, but yeah, I mean, you could, you could do that. You, you could complicate things. And I mean, and also level, at the level, the, the, the cellular communications, I mean, we can consider that the, this system as a force field. Yes. Because my background is it's, uh, it's mainly in um, um, MD simulations. So, so you, exactly, it's a, it's a kind of force field, right? You're good, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. In fact, the, the definition of, of um, what we call extracellular matrix, which is environment, it can be physical things, but it can be fields. It can be, I mean, you can have like, like more or less, I mean, parts of, of the environment where it's difficult to go through and, and others that it's much easier. Yeah, you could, you could do this. Yes, thank you. So thank you now yes. again very much for your presentation. So now we have the coffee break and we'll be back in uh, half an hour.
with you the second speaker of uh, today, this morning session, is uh, Alexander Bonven from the Utrecht University and is having his lectures, lecture on integrative modeling of biomolecular complexes. So, Alexander. Thank you very much for the, for the introduction and the kind invitation to speak here in Lugano. It's, uh, of course, a beautiful place and today is a beautiful day, but we are all stuck here in this lecture hall and you have to listen from me to me for the next one and a half hour. So I'm going to speak about um, integrative modeling of complexes. So the focus will be more on, uh, on larger biomolecular complexes today. Um, and this is, of course, come on. So we are in Switzerland. My home country is Switzerland, so of course I'm glad to be here, but I'm not from the Italian part, I'm from the French part, which is touched over the mountain, not so far away. But currently I'm based in Utrecht, at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. This is the, our academy building uh, in the old center of the city, and this is the building where I'm located. This is actually my office, so if you look very carefully, you should be able to see me work there. And uh, everything that I'm doing is in the context of uh, experiments and experimental groups because my group doing computational structural biology is embedded in an institute where structural biology in general and a lot of structural biology techniques are present. So everything that we have been doing over the years has been in the context of experimental people in the context of using experimental data as much as possible to guide the modeling process, hence this integrative modeling uh, title. So we are actually uh, operating as a European large-scale facility for NMR uh, through different projects, INEX, and there's the INEX Discovery one. So if you are in need of experimental access to NMR, you can come to Utrecht. And a lot of what we are doing on the computational side are also being supporting over the, supported over the year by different European projects that are giving you access to uh, the computational resource that we need to provide the services and the current one are BioExcel, a center of excellence in, for computational biomolecular research, and the European Open Science Cloud Hub project, which is providing us access to high throughput compute resources. So this is the uh, topic for today. So I'm going to give you a general introduction. Of course, by now, after Ruben's lecture yesterday, you're all experts in docking and in small molecule. So I guess I can go quite fast on some aspects. Uh, I want to speak a little bit about information sources that we can use to model complexes when the classical structural methods are failing or when they are too expensive or too time consuming. Uh, this will be very short. <clears throat> then I will tell you how we are approaching the problem, how we are using information to guide the modeling in HADOC, which is the method we have been developing for more than 15 years now. And I will uh, continue with some examples of using information and then depending on time, uh, you might decide what's the next topic that I'm going to speak about. In this multiple choice session, I have about 20 topics that I could speak about. So we will, we're in Switzerland, so in a very democratic way, you're going to vote and I can speak uh, forever. So we could skip lunch, but I uh, will not do that. Don't worry. Okay, so I should not move too far away from the computer apparently. So everything in life, and everything at a molecular, but everything at a human level is also uh, dictated by interactions between humans, interactions between molecules. This is a view of the center of Utrecht, where there is a beautiful canal ring, running through the city, full of terraces, and on those terraces, people are interacting. Now, at the molecular level, at the cellular level, interactions are everywhere as well, and actually the previous talk has also been dealing with this kind of network modeling of interactions. So here we want to dig more at the atomic level into what's happening when molecules talk to each other. So this brings us, so we have the genome, which contains, of course, all genomic information, DNA sequence. You go to the next level of organization, which is the proteome. So all the proteins that are expressed in a cell. And one level above that brings us to the interactome, or these networks that were presented in the previous talk, where each dot here represents a protein, and each connection between those represents an interaction. So if you do statistics on this kind of interactome data, and this can be obtained by high throughput techniques, so these are by no means um, accurate. So there's a lot of false positive 
So there are data in there that should not be there. There are also data in there that you don't see, so there's a lot of false negative as well. Anyway, if you do some statistics here, you will realize that there are many more lines than there are dots, meaning that each protein or each biomolecule during its lifetime is going to interact with up to 10 other molecules on average. So these can be binary interactions, but these can also be assemblies of multiple molecules that form complex assemblies. This looks like a two-dimensional uh, network, but actually there are many more dimensions to it because the network is not static. The network is going to be rewired depending on where you are in a cell cycle, depending also on where you are inside the cell. So are you in a nucleus or in a cytoplasm? Some interactions will be turned on and off. And another dimension that you have to add will be the post-translational modifications that are well known to modulate interactions as well. So it's a highly complex system. And if you want to understand this network at, at a molecular level, you will need to add the structural dimension to those interactions, meaning modeling or solving the structure by experimental method of those complexes. So if you want to look at the structural biology of interactions, we can go from the right to the, say, more experimental approach, to the left to the computational, the modeling approach. So the classical method to look uh, at structures, of course, is X-ray crystallography. NMR, although here you might have a size limit, so you can, for, for complexes, this might be uh, harder. X-ray also limits for complexes, like the, the binding affinity, if it's very weak, it might not crystallize, or you might only crystallize one of the components of the complex. And these days, cryo-electron microscopy, of course, is contributing a lot as well to solve or to, to cover this interactome space. But there are other methods here listed, which will be coming back later, that are providing you pieces of the puzzle. They are not going to provide you the full structure, but they're going to give you useful pieces. As you move to the left, then we, we enter the field of, of modeling. And if you're interested in structure, you can try to generate uh, structures by homology modeling. And you had a lecture yesterday about this topic, so you know everything about it. Threading falls also on that, that, that category. You might want to use molecular dynamics, but for today, the focus will be docking. And I don't uh, really need to introduce docking, but why is docking an uh, interesting approach? So these are old statistics taken from the Interactome 3D database uh, from Patrick Alloy in Barcelona. And you can update these, but the, the picture does not change that much. So this is statistics about the structural coverage of interactomes. So let's look, uh, let's look at human. So uh, at that time, there were 45 documented interactions in the database. There are many more interactions, okay? So if we think of the human proteome, how many proteins are encoded in our genome? Average, like so, some number? Okay, so how many proteins do we have are encoded in our genome? Sorry? 20,000, yes, 20, 22,000, whatever the number, it doesn't matter. But I told you we have on average maybe 10 interactions per protein, so this is bringing you to a level of several hundred of thousands of interactions. And those are dynamic, and the assemblies will consist of multiple molecules, so we are dealing with a, a structural interactome of several hundreds of those interactions. So it, it's going to be hard to study them, to characterize all of them experimentally. And this is reflected in what you find in a protein database. So this is a small number, 45,000. This is not hundreds of thousands, but these are only the interaction at the time for which there was experimental proof that this interaction was taking place in a cell. Okay, so these are documented, validated interaction. Now, if you look at those, for less than 5% of those at the time, there was a full structure of the complex available in a PDB. Another 5%, actually this together is less than 10%. Uh, you could have a domain-domain interaction model of structure. So you don't have the structure of the full complex, but structure of the parts that are important for the interaction. Or you can model the complex by homology modeling techniques. And then you have this big blue region, which is about 50% in this case, where we do have the structure of the interactors, but we don't know how they interact. And that's the good news for methods like docking because you have the starting point, you have the structure, and then you have to solve a 3D puzzle and put them together. And then you have one third here, which is gray, and this has probably not changed much if you go look at the statistics today, uh, where there is nothing. 
we don't have the structure we don't the, of the component we don't have the structure of the complex what do you find in there a lot of membrane membrane associated proteins will be in that class they are difficult to study experimentally but also a lot of intrinsically disordered proteins or protein that contain intrinsically disordered regions that again are very difficult to study by experimental methods so docking in a nutshell and again I should not need to explain that because it was explained to you yesterday but given two molecules can you solve this 3d puzzle how they interact in this case to proteins uh, so the field is about what is it close to 30 years old the first docking software for protein protein docking was uh, developed by Joel Jana and Shoshana Vodak, and this was late 70s, early 80s. And at the time, it was mainly shape complementarity, which was used as a measure of, uh, of the fit between the molecule. And then you can add physics, chemistry to it, electrostatic interactions, Van der Waals interactions, and, and whatever other type of energy function. And the search that you have to do if you assume that the molecule are rigid will be a six-dimensional search problem. You can fix one molecule at the origin of space of your coordinate system. You will have to translate the other molecule in three dimensions and sample all possible translation. And you will have to rotate the other molecule also along three axes. So that's a six dimensional search. And for each rotation that you sample, you have to sample all translation. Now add to that conformational variability, flexibility, and your, the dimensionality of your search space explodes. So, uh, speaking of docking, so we have this kind of conformational landscape which tells you, okay, this is my interaction landscape. You have some kind of energy that defines the quality of, a, of an interaction, of a model. So the sampling phase is generating models that cover this landscape. And then you have the scoring phase in uh, docking, which is basically measuring or predicting the quality of those models in order to distinguish or to predict which one is the best Hopefully, it should be the minimum of the energy function that you define. Now, if you have data, could be experimental data, but also bioinformatic data, you might decide to use the data to either bias the sampling, and you say, I'm not going to, to search the entire space anymore, but I'm going to concentrate my search in some region of space, and or you can use the data also in discriminating good from bad model. So if you use data during sampling, so instead of going for a systematic search of your interaction landscape, you're going to concentrate the search in one region. The good thing here is that you can spend maybe more time in the right region of space to, to fine tune your modeling. The danger is that if you have bad data, you're going to get bad results. That's the GIGO principle. So you can go in with Wikipedia, look up GIGO, it's the garbage in, garbage out principle. Okay, you put wrong data in your modeling software, you're going to get wrong models, but you're always going to get something. And then distinguishing what is wrong and right is not always simple. So it has advantages. You can direct the search to the relevant region of space, but it also has danger. And it depends very much on how much you trust the information that you have at hand to guide your modeling process. So in integrative modeling these days, uh, basically, we are referring to the techniques that are integrating data from different sources. And the sources is something we're going to discuss in the next uh, uh, few minutes uh, to get to the answer, which is, in our case, structure of some large biomolecular assemblies. And typically, when you move to large complex systems, there will not be one experimental technique that's going to give you all the answers that you need but you will have to combine different techniques. You have to integrate information from different techniques to guide your modeling process. So if you are an experimentalist, uh, you're going to generate models, and models are good. They are not there just to generate a nice picture in some papers, but the models are there to generate hypotheses. And with hypotheses, you can go back to the experimental to do experiments and validate your models. Uh, this is going to speed up structural determination, and you hope that the model allows you to understand better how things work. You might not have to have, you might not need to have a fully accurate model to start understanding things. You might not need to have a fully accurate model to start making prediction, to generate hypotheses that you can test in the lab. If you are more on the modeling side and you're going to use data, you hope that 
by using data, by integrating data, you're going to decrease your high false positive rate. So we generate a lot of models that are bad and they are not always easy to identify. And of course, having data allows you to assess the accuracy of your modeling. So these are a number of reviews that, that uh, we have been writing over the years on, on the topic of integrative modeling. I'm going to share the slides with you, so no need to take pictures. Uh, if you're interested in general in the field of docking, there is uh, every second year on average a special issue of proteins which is dedicated to CAPRI, and CAPRI stands for Critical Assessment of Predicate Interaction. It's a blind experiment where there is about 40 groups worldwide participating. It's usually protein-protein docking, but we also had recently peptide and oligosaccharides. And you can read in those issues what's the state of the art. And there should be a new issue appearing probably early 2020 about the latest rounds of, uh, of CAPRI. Okay, so let's move into information sources for the next few minutes. So when you can not study by classical structural method your, your complex, uh, it's not the end of the world because there might be still a lot of information. And it can start simply in a wet lab doing experiments, doing mutagenesis genesis experiments, where if you know the structure of your proteins, you can start mutating amino acid on a surface, and then you need to have some kind of binding assay, which can be a biophysical method, but which could be a biochemical method, like running a gel, could be as simple as that. And you assess if the mutation affects the binding or not. If the complex is still formed, you will uh, interpret this as this is not important for binding. If the complex is no longer formed, this is information telling you that this residue must be somewhere uh, involved in the interaction. It could also be that your protein is not stable anymore and then your protein is not folded. And of course, uh, if it's not folded, it's not going to interact. So you have to check these kind of things. But this is information at the residue level, at the amino acid level which is, of course, useful. What you see a lot these days are uh, cross-linking experiments uh, coupled with mass spectrometry as a detection method. So here you are using small chemicals that have typically two warheads, and they are connected by a flexible linker. Those warheads, uh, the classical one attached to lysine side chain on the surface of proteins, and since there are two warheads, they are going to, collect, to connect to two lysines, provided they are uh, at the maximum possible distance, in, uh, at, uh, at the right distance in space. Now, the distance depends on the linker, and there are different chemistries there. Uh, you do this experiment in solution. Of course, you might get cross-links that are intramolecular, and you will also get cross-links that are intermolecular. And then the detection is to digest of protein with proteases, and you detect the fragment peptides. And from time to time, you go, you're going to detect peptides that are connected by the linker. And this is giving you now distance information between specific residues. That distance is not going to be very accurate. You will have an upper limit, which depends on the linker that you are using, which might be up to 30 angstrom. And the lower limit, you don't know, because you don't know if the linker is extended or it might be folded. Okay, so you can impose upper limits. But this is very, uh, so the detection by MS is very sensitive. So you can do these experiments with very little amount of sample. And these days, people are even able to do these experiments in living cells. So you can do the cross-linking in living cells, detect the complex that are present in a cell. Of course, you have to lyse the cell, uh, digest the proteins to do the detection, but the experiment can be done in living cells. So that's very useful information. HD exchange is another experimental technique that you can use to map interfaces. So here you do two types of experiments, one with the isolated protein, one with the complex, and you're going to compare those. Uh, you dissolve your protein in D2O, and all the exchangeable protons are going to exchange for deuterons. And then you can detect that by MS again, also by NMR, it's possible. And the regions that are protected from exchange might indicate the binding site. Okay, so this is information, again, which is potentially useful. Uh, since it's MS, you don't need a lot of sample to do this kind of information. Uh, you might not only detect binding site, but you might also detect allosteric effects. 
Uh, does everyone know what allosteric is when I mention allosteric? Yes? Okay. NMR uh, was also, uh, or is also a method which allows you to detect interactions. Uh, so here now you need uh, to label one of your protein and you can run uh, experiments where you are basically correlating the protons that are attached to a nitrogen 15. So you need to label your, pro uh, your proteins. And in these experiments, you will see one signal per amino acid. On average, there are a few side chain and there's one amino acid that you don't see, which amino acid has no NH. Chemistry question, I guess. One chance out of 20 to get it right. Hmm? Proline, yes, exactly. So you don't see prolines in these uh, experiments. So what do you do? So you're only looking at one of the components of your complex, and then you titrate another molecule in solution. And if something binds, you expect the signal to shift in your experiments. It depends on the binding strength, but uh, so if you have weak binding, you will see a shift of signal. This one is not shifting, so these are different concentrations of the second molecule that you're adding. And this is pinpointing basically the binding site on the surface of your protein. Again, you will detect a hysteric effect here. This is used a lot also in the pharma industry to, do, to screen for small drugs. If you want to know, is the small molecule binding, but also where is it binding, it's very useful information. So again, all the information that we have seen now doesn't tell you who they are binding. They are just telling you where something is binding. Maybe only the crosslinks is giving you really a distance information between two points, but everything else is giving you bits, bits pieces of the puzzle. More NMR, and then uh, experiments like small angle X-ray scattering, cryo-EM, if you are still stuck at low resolution, is going to give you shape information, which is also valuable. Then you can start docking into these shapes. So this is information, and there are plenty of methods uh, that you can use to derive bits uh, of information. And if you don't have any exper experimental data, it's not the end of the day because you can rely on bioinformatics maybe to predict things. And uh, for example, in sequence, so if you do sequence alignment, you might often you associate sequence conservation as this is important for defining the fold of your protein. Now, if you start seeing conservation of amino acid on the surface of a protein, it must be for a good reason. And usually that reason is that this is involved in a binding site maybe, or it's an active site of an enzyme. So there's information in sequence, and there are many software that have been uh, developed over the year to do that. And we have developed quite some time ago a software called Whiskey for doing that because it's a good combination with Haddock. As it's here, Haddock has nothing to do with the fish. Okay, you will see later on. So Haddock is the, the captain, the friend of Tintin. So he's kind of, uh, he's swearing a lot, he's drinking a lot, he likes whiskey. So that was uh, the reason why we gave, we gave the name. So anyway, so there are plenty of software where you can try to predict based on sequence and based on structure as well, try to predict where things are binding. And this is also information. And uh, so we also have a consensus uh, server which combines different software into a consensus prediction, kind of a meta server to predict those. So this is just a snapshot of the server. Let's move on. So what do you do with all those data? Okay, they, they are not telling you how things interact, but they are useful. So you can decide to use the data a posteriori. So you use your favorite modeling software. You're going to generate a lot of models, and then you use the data to filter the solutions. The other way will be to use the data a priori to transform the information that you have in some kind of energy function, which you're going to use during the docking, during the optimization process to guide the search. And this is the route that we have been taking in developing Haddock. So I think I will go very fast on those aspects. So I already explained you, so you have uh, in principle six degrees of freedom. You need to sample space. Um, and there are different approach to that. But again, I think this is kind of a repetition of what you probably heard. Uh, so there are rigid body docking software in which molecules are treated as rigid. There's no flexibility possible. So all the fast Fourier transformation technique-based methods are following this, uh, meaning that 
the models that you're going to get at the end will have typically clashes at the interface. You will have to do some refinement after end. Uh, and there are also, on the other side, there are the energy-driven methods where you're going to use energy minimization, uh, Monte Carlo, genetic algorithms to, to search this interaction space. So now you're no go longer going to systematically sample all possible solutions, but you're going to search your energy landscape. So this is like looking for the lowest altitude point in Switzerland in a complex uh, energy landscape. So here you will have to sample, also increase your sampling, because depending on where you start your search in Switzerland, you will get stuck in local minima. So you have to have a strategy or to do that. Now flexibility, so fle flexibility makes everything harder. Uh, it means that you have an increased number of degrees of freedom, so you need to start describing side chain motion, you need to describe backbone conformational changes, so everything becomes more complicated. And what also, uh, what is also a problem now is that the scoring becomes also more complicated because your energy landscape uh, changes, becomes much more rugged and complex and although it might be a better approach to put flexibility, it might just give you a trouble, uh, a problem in identifying then what are good solutions. Another problem, and that's still pretty much a challenge in the field, it's very hard to predict a priori if a molecule is going to change its conformation when it's binding to its partner. There are plenty of modeling methods that allow you to study, say, mechanical properties of proteins. So you might be able to predict that the protein is going to do this kind of motion by running molecular dynamic simulations or an elastic network model or whatever method. If the binding site in this example is in my back, this motion is completely irrelevant for the docking in principle. And usually, if you play a lot of tricks, you, you, you use complex methods to generate a lot of conformation, and you don't need those for the binding process, you are complicating, again, the entire modeling process. You're going to generate a lot of different uh, models for your complex, and you might have a very hard time to distinguish what are the good ones from the bad ones. So it's, um, my advice in modeling in general is to start as simple as possible, and if things don't work, move to the next level and introduce a higher level of, of uh, description of your model. But we are unable to, well, predicting conformational changes is still very much a challenge. Okay, so flexibility is also a challenge. Uh, so most methods uh, can only deal with rather small changes. So there are benchmarks that we use in the field for protein-protein docking, uh, where we know the structure of the free proteins and we know the structure of the complex, and they are classified in different categories uh, in terms of difficulty for the docking. And everything which has a conformational change of more than two 2.5 angstrom so these are not large changes. These are still rather small changes. Everything above 2.5 falls under the difficult category. Okay, so docking approach are never going to fold an alpha helix on a binding site. So you will have to, approach, to use different approach for that. Okay, so if you expect that you have huge conformational changes, you will have to do something different because the, the classical docking approach are not going to work for those. They are very limited. So intrinsically disordered protein that only fold upon binding to their targets, they are very difficult to model. And how you treat flexibility depends on the choices that you make in the representation of the system. So if you use FFT-based methods, which use grids, then you have a rigid system, for example. Okay, now scoring, in principle, this is the holy grail, because if you have the perfect scoring function, the remaining of the problem is just computing time because then you can generate billions of models. If your scoring function is perfect, you're going to find a solution to your problem. Our scoring functions are not perfect. Uh, they depend on the system, how you represent the system. They depend on the flexibility. And you see also in the field that people are developing functions that are specific to a given type of problems, optimized for antibody antigen complexes, optimized for molecule, small molecule docking. So there is not a universal scoring function that works for everything. So what do you find in there? All kind of energetic terms, typically. Intermolecular energies, electrostatic, van der Waals, you might have hydrogen bonding, the amount of surface which is buried at the interface. Uh, so protein-protein complexes, it is used a lot. Dissolvation energy, 
statistics, amino acid interpropensities, or maybe even atom-atom uh, contact propensities that are derived from analysis of complexes in the PDB. So any combination of those will be uh, found there. And of course, if you have data, you can use the data in the scoring step as well. What is also often done is uh, not to look at individual models that you are generating, but you're going to cluster the solution so that you uh, assess the ensemble of models that you have been generating on the cluster basis. This kind of simplifies a bit the analysis because you will have usually less clusters than the number of models that you generate. Some software even use the size of the cluster as a scoring term. Uh, it depends very much how you do the search, if you can do this or not. Okay, now let's move now to more specifics of Haddock. By the way, if there is any question or something which is unclear at any time, just stop me and ask. Don't wait until the end. Yes? Good. So Haddock has been developed for more than 15 years now as an integrative modeling platform. And you find back here all the experimental data sources that we have been discussing. So we can integrate all of this data in some kind of energy function. Uh, currently, the new version of Haddock is able to handle up to 20 different molecules at the same time. So we're not speaking only about binary docking, but we can build multi-component assemblies in one go. Um, I didn't speak about symmetry, but symmetry is also information. So if you know that you, you are dealing with a symmetrical complex, you can impose that in your search. Uh, so that's uh, useful. We allow for flexibility at the interface. So we have a refinement stage where we allow for flexibility along the side chain and, and the backbone. And we have been, over the years, uh, performing uh, among the top groups in CAP3. So how do we encode this information? So you know that some residues are important for the binding, but you don't know which contact they make. And then you have to define some energy function based on this information. So the way we do that is by using what we call ambiguous distances. And this is a concept that has, which is coming from NMR. It was uh, introduced by uh, Michael Nilges in 91 to deal with the ambiguity in the assignment of NMR signals. But basically what we are, uh, so if you have a number of amino acids that you have identified at the interface on one side, as these are important, and you have uh, the same thing on the other side. So these are also amino acids that you have identified as being part of the interaction. Uh, we distinguish two categories in Haddock. We say these are the, the, the active ones are the one for which you have data. You say, okay, this is an important residue. So in principle, it should be at the interface. And then we usually add increase the definition of the interface by selecting all the neighbors of those active residues. Because experimentally, you're never going to fully sample the interface. So you're usually missing information. Since we want to use the information to guide the modeling, for us, it's important to have a good coverage of the active side, rather than having very accurate few predictions. So we have these uh, active residue red ones, we have these what we call passive grid ones, and we're going to calculate all possible distances between all atoms of one active residue on this side and all atoms of all active and passive on this side. Let's assume that we have on average 10 atoms per amino acid. So if I have one active on one side and 10 on the other side, you can calculate 1,000 individual distances. So these are all the atom-atom combinations, okay? Those distances you're going to sum using this function, one of a distance to the sixth power. So this is dipole-dipole interactions. So this is kind of the NMR, uh, an NMR energy function, but this is also the attractive part of a lennard jones potential, if you think of von der Waals interactions. So this sum, and then you take the inverse six root of this sum, and this is giving you one effective distance. This distance has the property that it's going to be shorter than any distance that enter the sum. And then we use this distance in some kind of harmonic potential to define a restraint to guide the docking. So effectively what we have, we have this network of ambiguous distances that are going to bring the interface together, but they are not predefining in which orientation the binding should take place because you could have any combinations because we calculate all distances, okay? 
if you have a cross-link, you know exactly which pair should be uh, defined. But if you just have interface information, you don't know what the contact should be. And these ambiguous distance restraints allow for any type of contact as long as the interface are coming together. Our energy function is not harmonic, but it becomes linear after some uh, region so that the forces becomes constant, which is helping for the uh, molecular dynamics type of simulation that we are doing. What we also do by default, because uh, we realize that the data are never perfect, so we randomly delete 50% of the information for each docking trial that we are doing. So in that way, you hope that you're going to get rid of false positive data in your data set, and then you hope to convert to the right solution. This also has the effect that from time to time you're going to throw away the good information and you're going to end up in bad region of the interaction space. And it will be up to your scoring function then to discriminate things. Next to that, we use a classical force field. So we describe all the bonds, the angles, rotation around bonds and the non-bonded interaction. And we use a combination of energy minimization and molecular dynamic simulations to do the docking actually. So molecular dynamics, I probably don't need to explain you that, but based on Newton's second law of motion. So once we have defined our energy function, we can calculate forces. And if we know the forces, we can integrate Newton's second law of motion to propagate the system as a function of time. And you get basically a molecular, molecular movie of your, of your system. And this is used to basically search uh, this energy landscape. Now, the docking protocol in HADOC consists of three stages. In the first stage, we treat the molecule as rigid, rock solid. And we are going to do here an energy minimization to bring the molecule together based on the data that we put in. In the second phase, we're going to heat up the system. So we do some kind of simulated annealing protocol, higher temperature, and then cooling down slowly. And at that stage, we introduce flexibility. And in the final stage, we solvate the system with a, uh, a layer of water, and we do a very short molecular dynamics, extremely short. Nothing spectacular happens here, but it helps in the energetics of the system, and it helps in the scoring. Uh, so minimization, it's usually quite a fast uh, step, although there are software that are way faster than ours. But here we sample in the order of 10 to 100,000 solutions. Internally, we write maybe thousands to 10,000 to disk. Uh, so this is really the sampling, and the, the starting point are randomly orientated and separated molecules. We take uh, 10 to 20% of these rigid body solutions, and now we go through a flexible refinement stage. So now we do molecular dynamics in torsion angle space, and we introduce flexibility first along the side chain at the interface, and then along side chain and backbone. And at the end, uh, we refine in explicit solvent. We support two types of solvent. Uh, we have water using the T3P model, and we also have a DMSO uh, model to mimic membrane. Yes. So we are going, so our simulated and ending protocol starts, we start at high temperature. Mm -hmm. So it, we don't put position restraints to slowly release the system like you will do in molecular dynamics. Mm -hmm. This will take way too much time. Yes. So the, the, the molecules are free to move from the start. Mm -hmm. And actually we start at high temperature, but we still have the restraints to keep the interface together. Okay, so you're not doing free dynamics there, otherwise bad things will happen, yes. Wow. So this is basically an illustration for a two-body docking. So this will be the starting point, randomly rotated molecules. So one molecule here is at the center, and all the other one will be the second molecule. So they are oriented around the first one. And we do the first uh, rigid body minimization. Let's see if this works. So let's go back here. So this is what's happening in a computer. The residues that you see are spheres are the one for which we have some kind of information. In this case, we're NMR data. So this brings uh, your system together. 
And the result of that is since we have information about the binding side, you see that so we had super these are 200 solutions superimposed on this blue protein here. So they all sample the same phase of that protein because they were data pointing to that region, but they are oriented in all kinds of different ways because we don't have specific contact defined. Okay, so this looks like spaghettis. So now we take uh, the top uh, typically 200 models and we go into a flexible stage. So now we're doing first rigid body dynamics and then you will see that we introduce flexibility along the side chain. So we optimize the interface. In the next phase, the backbone will also be optimized. Look at this loop here, it just flipped over. So in that way, you can describe small induced conformational changes. The amount of changes that you describe here is not going to be huge. It depends very much on the amount of data that you have in. So it might be one angstrom, maybe two angstrom if you're lucky. The more data you put in, the more conformational changes you might be able to induce. So we have seen cases where you can go up to four angstrom, five angstrom conformational changes using, for example, tri OEM data. If you have no data at all, or there is an ab initio mode in, in, in ad hoc as well, the amount of changes that are happening during this phase is rather limited. So again, don't expect miracles. So what is the impact of this? So we still have multiple orientations here, but you see that we start seeing a convergence of solutions. So these were spaghettis. These are now linguine. And if you don't know what linguine are, you are in an Italian part of Switzerland, so ask to be Italian people here, they will explain. These are the flatter, uh, you take a spaghetti and you smash it and you get this flatter one. So at the end, we, we refine in solvent and then we do a clustering and we're going to assess the clusters to do our scoring. So the scoring is not based on individual model, the scoring is based on the clusters. And we calculate the average score on the best four model of each cluster. We don't use the cluster size in our scoring function, but we take the top four model of each. So in terms of flexibility, what do we have? Uh, we have an implicit way of dealing with flexibility, meaning we can do the modeling not from a single structure, but we can also start our modeling from an ensemble of conformation. So we're not going to do a docking run for each conformation, but we give an ensemble to the software and they are going to be used in that way. Uh, so you should not give too large ensembles because you have a dilution problem. If only one conformation is able to lead to the right solution, and you give 1,000 conformation, you only have one chance out of 1,000 to, to hit that conformation, okay? So you want to limit the number of models. And then we have the explicit, uh, the other level of implicit flexibility. We do scale down intermolecular interactions between the, in the simulated and inning phase. And then we have the explicit level at side chain and backbone level, as you have seen in the movie. We do clustering. And then we calculate a rather simple score so we have scores at different stages. So this is the rigid body, flexible, and water refinement score. And here, what do you find? So you find the intermolecular van der Waals energy, 20% of the electrostatic energy, intermolecular, a dissolvation energy term, and this term is actually from ribbon. So we, uh, we use this dissolvation. So this is telling you that if you bury hydrophobic groups at the interface, it's usually good because you remove water from hydrophobic surface. If you start burying charges, you're going to pay a price for it. Okay, so that's an empirical term which depends on the amount of surface accessible of the, of the atoms at the interface. And we have the experimental terms also in this scoring function. So this was optimized 16 years ago on maybe three, four complexes, so it's not a large data set. Uh, and also maybe chemical intuition a bit at the time. But it has survived 15 years of optimization I have people in a group that like to do machine learning and come with nice models, and they improve a little bit the scoring for protein-protein, but that function doesn't work anymore for protein nucleic acid. So we use this function for pretty much everything, and the scoring functions are still limited in the accuracy, okay? We don't have the perfect scoring function. So using 1.0 is nice and simple. You could maybe optimize the function by putting there 0.97337, in terms of accuracy, it's not going to make any difference. So again, keep things simple, simple when you can. So sense and simplicity is my motto. It should make sense, whatever approach you choose, and it should be simple. So start simple and go to the next level only if you need it. 
some statistics from, uh, so this was CAS Capri round uh, 2014. Slides from Shoshana Vodak. So at that time, we only participated as a web portal. Uh, it means we don't have to do ab initio modeling. So if we find data, we can put it in a portal, but you have to take the ranking that the portal is giving you. And these are the statistics from that round. So in that round, we are doing very well. And in another round, we were somewhere down. Uh, so this is ad hoc, and this is the scoring. So Capri has two parts. One, you are trying to predict the complexes, and the other part, you are trying to score solutions, and you are given solutions from all the groups. So typically, you have a few thousand models, and you have to fish out which are the, the good ones. And we use the very simple function that I've shown you in that round. We didn't really look at things. We did things automatically. So this simple function, which might seem maybe naive, uh, is working well enough in this context in scoring models that are coming from different software, different groups. So most of our users are using ad hoc through the web portal, and you're going to uh, use the web portal this afternoon in the tutorial. So we have uh, a large number of, of uh, docking runs that have been served over the years. It's active since 2008, and more than probably today, about 45% of all the docking has been performed on those high throughput compute resources that are distributed around Europe because of the support of EGI and those European projects here. So we are sending jobs mostly to European resource, but also China, Taiwan, uh, in the past also the US, the Open Science Grid. So we are able to provide these services because of this support. Uh, this is just a, a view of our user base. So we have a nice coverage of the world. We have to work a bit on Africa, but otherwise it's quite nice. Uh, some recent development, some highlights. So I already mentioned that we can now go up to 20 molecules. So the new version, or, so the portal we just saw is handling a maximum of six molecules. And the new version, which actually you're going to use this afternoon in the tutorial, can go up to 20 and can also support uh, cryo-electron uh, microscopy data. So for if you are at lower resolution, if you have high resolution data in cryo EM, you don't need to do docking. You can build your model straight into the maps. But there will be cases where the resolution is still limited, where you might need to go to the docking approach. So now we can handle this kind of data as well. So we are part of the BioXL Center of Excellence, uh, which is a European project. And tomorrow, the two lecturers that you will have are also part of this, uh, of this project. And as part of this project, we have a forum for HADOC where you can find a lot of information. So it's, it's a help center, basically. A lot of questions have been asked and answered. Uh, so you can search. If you want to post questions, you will have to register. But if you are looking for an answer, it might already be there. Although people usually tend not to look for answers, but ask the same question again and again. It's probably the nature of human. Okay, so next to Haddock, which is our, say, our flagship software, we also have a number of other servers that we are providing that are doing different things. Uh, this is for NMR structure calculations. Uh, this is for predicting the binding affinity of, uh, of a complex, a very simple model, no free energy calculation. Uh, this I might talk about uh, later. Bioinformatic predictions, hotspot predictions. So these are residue that, if mutated, should give a change in binding affinity of at least 2 kcal per mole. And we have also some uh, cryo -EM fitting software there and modeling of DNA. All of it accessible through this website. Okay, let's move now to some application example of what can we do with these kind of, uh, of approaches. Now the first one uh, is a story about iron piracy. So this is a, a receptor protein which is uh, it's a bacterial receptor. And the bacteria needs iron for its survival. And to get the iron, it's actually hijacking a small protein from its host, a ferredoxin protein, which contains an iron sulfur cluster. So there are two iron atoms per protein in that one. So to, get, to grab these irons, the, uh, the, the bacteria needs to internalize ferredoxin. And it does that through this receptor. And by the way, this is Captain Haddock. If you don't know him, that's the the guy we are usually referring to. So uh, in this group of people here, they, were, uh, they are crystallographers, they are NMR people, and they are modelers, us. Um, so 
So they try, of course, to first crystallize the complex, but they never managed to co-crystallize with uh, ferredoxin. So they got a nice crystal structure of the receptor, and this was the first structure that contained all the loops well resolved, um, but no, nothing about the complex. Still, if you look at this structure, there's information because you know which part is in principle in the membrane, and you also know which loops are the extracellular loop, the one which should actually grab ferredoxin. So this is information. So since that could not crystallize the complex, they resolved to NMR to study the other partner, ferredoxin, and they, do, they did this HSQC experiment that I, I, I showed you before. And what you see in this plot is the sequence, the amino acid sequence in terms of numbers, and this will be the displacement of the signal in the spectra when you do this titration experiment. And you see that there are specific regions along the sequence that are affected by the binding. So now you're looking at ferredoxin and you are titrating the receptor in solution. If you look at this on the 3D structure of ferredoxin, this defines a well-defined interface. This is information that we're going to give to Haddock. Now on the receptor, in principle, we, can, we cannot do the NMR of the receptor, but we have information about the extracellular loop. So what we're going to tell Haddock is that this region of ferredoxin should be binding somewhere on the surface of the receptor, which is on the outside, okay? And if you do that, this is, what, uh, this is the top two cluster that you are getting. So this is the, the cluster number one, which is also the largest. Uh, if you look at the score, so this is the Haddock score, this simple combination of electrostatic Van der Waals dissolvation. Uh, look at the standard deviations, so you could not say that this is a much better solution than this one, they are overlapping, okay, so actually you should look at both solutions. Uh, this is a view of the top solution, so based on this model, the next step would be, and this was not done in the publication, but this is follow-up work, to propose mutations at the interface of this complex that will validate this model. So if you have two sets of solutions, you should look which mutations should I make to try to distinguish between the solutions. And then you can go back to the lab, test it, and then validate one of those two models. And potentially use the data that you generate to improve your model. Another example using NMR data in this case, uh, as you know, proteins are uh, ubiquitinated. So proteins are ubiquitinated to tag them for degradation, but it can also be a signaling pathway. And there are different ways of, of connecting ubiquitin because they are so the connection is for lysine to the C-terminal, so it's an isopeptide bond, and there are different ways, there are more lysines. But in this particular example, there were two different uh, connections that uh, we were interested to look at. Actually, Annalisa Pastor in London was interested to look at. Uh, so there's an enzyme called Josephine, which cleaves ubiquitin before the substrate is degraded. So we want to avoid degrading ubiquitin, we want to reuse ubiquitin to tag over protein. And the question they were uh, asking was, is there a preference for the enzyme for lysine 48 or lysine 63 linkage? Again, they could not solve the, the, by classical NMR the structure of the complex, but there was information about the binding site. So from chemical shift perturbation experiments, there were two binding sites identified on Josephine, one on this side, one on this side. There were also some mutation data. So this is information that we're going to use. And next to that, there is another piece of information. It's the catalytic triad. It's an enzyme. It has to clear the peptide bond. So in our modeling, if the enzyme is to work, a terminus of one ubiquitin should come close to this catalytic triad. In principle, we could use this as information as well, but we did not. It's always good if you can afford to have some data that you don't, do not use in your modeling so that you can validate your model based on the data that you set aside. Since we didn't know uh, which uh, connectivity is it lies in 48 or 63, what we did was a free body docking, two ubiquitin, Josephine, those data, plus one additional distance restraint, an ambiguous restraint, which connects one ubiquitin, the C terminal of one ubiquitin, to either lies in 63 or lies in 48. Okay, so that's again an ambiguous distance. It can be one or the other, it doesn't matter. And then we dock using this information and then you look what you're getting at the end. 
So what are you getting at the end? You get models in which you recover the, C the 48 linkage. So you see the two ubiquity, and in this conformation, you see that the C terminal of the first one is coming nice at proximity of the catalytic triad. Of course, you also get the 63 linkage because it's allowed by the data. So if your sampling is good, you should get this information as well. And this, the second ubiquitin has kind of the same conformation, but the first one now is rotated. If you look at the helix here, you can see the difference in orientation. And this makes that the C-terminal now is moving away from the catalytic triad. Okay, so based on this information, our preferred model was this one, meaning that the enzyme should have a preference for the 48 linkage because it's putting it in the right conformation for the catalysis to take place. Now, if you do the biochemical experiment, this is indeed what you are seeing. This is time, and this is the percentage of product, of reaction product, so the cleave ubiquitin. You see the enzyme is still able to cleave the 63 linkage, but not so efficiently. If you have the 48 linkage, it's much more efficient. So we have a model that explains basically the biochemistry of the system. It might not be a fully accurate model, but it's good enough to explain uh, what we observe. Now, we spoke also about uh, data that you can collect by MS. So let's have a look at this kind of data. Uh, this is the work of uh, Adrien, former postdoc in my group. And this has to do with uh, uh, the modeling of a bacterial circadian clock machinery. Do you all know what a circadian clock is? Some yes, some nothing. So, so it's the reason why Ruben is jet lagged. Uh, I think you are the only one coming from, uh, from the US. Okay, so we have a clock machinery in our cells that are basically keeping track of, uh, of time. Uh, so this clock has a given frequency and when you travel abroad to over time zones, it takes quite some time until you adjust the clock. So it's a molecular clock. And uh, the one that we are interested at in this case was a, a cyanobacteria clock. And the interesting part about this one is that you only need three proteins, K, A, B, and C. So if you express those proteins, you mix them in a test tube, you add ATP, and you add phosphate, and the clock starts ticking. That's all you need. How do you know the clock is ticking? You can monitor phosphorylation, dysphosphorylation by MS. So you do MS experiments at different time points, and you see that there is a phosphorylation, dysphosphorylation phosphorylation of specific size, and you can measure the frequency of the clock, okay? So that's really a molecular clock, just mix things and hope magic happens. Uh, at that time, there was no structural information on how this works. There were structures of the component for KB and KC, but we didn't know how they interact. So what was the information that we had from native MS? So in native MS, you are not digesting your protein and cutting them in fragments, but you are looking at the full complex, which is flying in the spectrometer. So you know the stoichiometry, and that's the first piece of information that you need if you want to model complexes. In this case, it's six to one. So six KB are binding to one KC. And then we also add HD exchange data. I explained you this type of data before. So this is now giving us information about the potential binding region on the surface of those proteins. So if you look at KB, so this was the crystal structure uh, which was available at the time. If you map the HD exchange data, it indicates that these helices seems to be the binding site. There were some additional data from mutagenesis, so we're going to use all those data for the modeling. This is KC, so KC is a much larger uh, protein. Uh, you can see that there is a six-fold symmetry when you look from the top. Um, so they are, this explains the six to one uh, binding. It's kind of a double donut because you can open it and you see that there is a hole in the center. And all the blue regions are the regions that are affected when KB is binding. So there are changes in HD exchange protection. And you see that we have a problem. We see now six binding sites on the top. We see six binding sites at the bottom. So that's 12 already. And if you open your donut, there is even change in protection at the interface between those. So what's happening, we have again here an allosteric process. So something happens, something binds either at the top or at the bottom, and a signal is transmitted to the other side. 
and this is controlling this phosphorylation dephosphorylation. So what did we do at the time? We say, well, let's select one binding site here and one binding site at the bottom. So this is the C1 binding and this is C2 binding, and we're going to do two docking experiments, one targeting the top, one targeting the bottom. So if you do that, you end up with a set of, uh, of complexes for the top solution. You end up with a set of complexes for the bottom solution. And we could not really distinguish based on the score which one was better. We had one piece of information that we did not use in the modeling, which I did not mention yet. It's what is called collision cross-section. So in MS, you can do an experiment where if you do native MS, your, your protein complex is flying in the vacuum of the spectrometer against a gas flow of, of small molecule ions. And you can measure the time it takes for that molecule to bridge a given distance. And depending on the shape of the molecule, this time will vary. Just think a cigar will fly differently from a donut because of the hydrodynamic properties of the system. Okay, so in MS, you can measure this time and you can relate this time to this collision cross-section. And if you have a structure, if you have a model, you can back calculate what this collision cross-section should be and compare to your experimental data. Now, this is what we did for all those clusters. So the orange one are the top solutions, the green one are the bottom solutions, and the two dotted line is the experimental range for this collision cross-section. So based on this experimental data, we decided that probably the orange one is the right solution, and this is our best score cluster for the orange one, which is nicely in the middle. So we basically at that time predicted this being a model of the binding of KB to KC. This was published in uh, PNIS at the time, and everyone was happy. Then two years later, a cryo-EM model, a structure, came out, which showed a full complex, KA, KB, KC, and this structure revealed that this is the correct model. Okay, so I told you the garbage in, garbage out. So this is an example of the danger of modeling. Usually you might never speak about those things, you just bury them and forget about them, but uh, this is a good learning moment, okay? Things will go wrong when you do experiments, when you do modeling, you just have to accept that and you should not bury bad data or things that you don't like, but you should learn from them. So what went wrong? In this case, we selected our model based on experimental data. Okay, so actually the data pointed us to the wrong model, actually. So we can blame the experimental data. That's a bit easy, but uh, talking to experimental people, MS people, uh, they also told me, well, you are dealing with a molecule which is not globular. So KC has this hole inside. So when you do those experiments, you know it's a bit dangerous because there could be compactation of the structure. So what you are measuring is an underestimate of what you would have in solution. So that's one thing. So that could explain why the data do not match the model. But there's another issue here, and that's nature playing tricks with us. So the crystal structure that we used at the time was the four that I show you. At the same time, they published the cryo -EM structure. Another crystal structure of KB was published. And this is a comparison of the secondary structure of those two crystal structures. These are the same sequence, okay? There's no difference, it's the same protein. But look at this one, so this, has, this is alpha, uh, beta, alpha, beta. So the first part is similar, okay, no problem. But look at the second part. We have beta, alpha, alpha, beta, and here we have alpha, beta, beta, alpha. So it's a complete change in the fold of the protein. Same sequence, two completely different folds. So hopefully this is not happening too often. The crystallization conditions were different. Uh, this is a quote from the paper. And uh, so there is this, uh, what they say, this highly populated in inactive tetrameric form. That's the GS1. And that's the structure that we had at the time when we did the modeling. And then this is the one that was published at the same time as the cryo-EM data. So switch in folds because of change of crystallization condition or concentration. So something happened there. So we have to hope that this is not happening too often. Otherwise, we are in big trouble and you cannot trust anything in a PDB. Okay? There are other examples of proteins where you just need to do one mutation and the fold changes completely. Okay? So, so we are sometimes in metastable states, I guess, in terms of protein structure and small differences can induce large conformational changes. But okay, this is really the exception. So now, so 
we have been revisiting this, uh, this system, so we are dealing with a large system, so small intermezzo. <coughs> Another development in Haddock is that we have been introducing the Martini force field now in Haddock, so that we can do coarse grain mobbling. Basically, we represent in Martini, Martini is not ours, it's developed in Groningen, in Cooper, Sieverty, and Marink. So we are mapping four atoms into one particle. So we have a four to one mapping, meaning that we have less particle that we need to consider in our modeling. It also has the advantage that it smoothens a bit the energy landscape. So we are winning time, and we might have a smoothened energy landscape. Uh, so this is now out, uh, this has just been published in uh, GCTC. Uh, that's the Martini uh, reference, but the Haddock Martini paper is out also in GCTC. So we took now the KC molecule. We took the same information that we used in the previous work, so HD exchange mutagenesis. <coughs> Instead of docking one KB onto one binding site, so now we're going to dock six KB simultaneously onto KC. So it's a, it's a seven-body docking problem. We do that at, at the coarse grain level. And if you do that, you see that now uh, the C1 uh, model, which is the bottom binding site, which is the cryo-EM uh, structure, has a score in terms of Haddock score, which is way better than the top model. So now we are able to distinguish in terms of score using the correct fold of KB. Uh, it's about seven-fold speed up in terms of computational time. And you can take those models uh, and fit it into the cryo-EM map uh, we did that using camera, and you get a correlation for the docked model of 0.82, and if you take the cryo-EM structure, which is about five angstrom resolution that was deposited, you get 0.84, okay? So it's not so bad. Again, it's a model, it's not perfect, there are still small differences, but uh, considering we are doing a seven-body docking, it's quite an amazing result. Okay. So now, uh, last part before the multiple choice, so we should have a little bit of time to address some the topic of your choice. So we've been speaking so far a lot about using data to, uh, to model things, and I've shown you examples also when things went wrong because there were problems in the data, or there were problems in the structure. And uh, so it will be nice to be able to actually measure or assess the reliability of the data and the information content of the data before you take the step to modeling a complex. Okay, so can we clean up the data maybe in some way before using them? And this is very much related to the work that we've been doing on using cross-linked data from mass spectrometry. Um, so again, this is a cartoon showing you the, the, the process of doing this cross-linking. The problem with cross-links, so they have these reactive heads that are highly reactive, and you might cross-links molecules that do not correspond to the stable native state of your complex. So you might have encounter complex, maybe on the way to the native complex, or maybe random collision in solution, which are reactive and you're going to detect cross-links. So there are false positive data typically in the cross-linking experiments. I think if people want to get reliable data, what they often do is to repeat the experiments multiple times and see which cross-links do I consistently detect over multiple experiments. And there are other statistics that you can use to try to improve the, the accuracy of your cross-links. So, so the idea here, and this is the work of uh, Guido, a former PhD student, uh, was to try to uh, assess the information content of those cross-links and possibly detect false positive before we use them for modeling in Haddock. So the question is, given two structures and a set of distance restraints, so now we're speaking about cross-links, but in principle you can do that with any type of distance information. So are there solutions that will satisfy a subset or all the restraints? Okay, that's the question. Now a solution in this context is a complex that satisfies the restraints, and a complex is a conformation where the subunits are interacting, so there should be an interaction between them, and they are not clashing. So there is no energetics consideration in what we're going to do. It's purely geometry. We want the, the molecules should touch each other, but they should not overlap with the core. Now, the accessible interaction space is going to be defined as the set of all possible solutions that satisfy a given number of restraints. So is there a unique solution, or are there many solutions that are consistent with the data that you have? 
How are we going to do that? We are going to use docking tricks. So we're going back to fast Fourier transform based docking techniques, the Richie body docking techniques. So we take the largest molecule, the receptor, <coughs> we map it onto a grid, we define a core in blue, so they should not be overlap with the core, and we define the surface in gray, which will be, they should be overlap with the surface to define an interaction. So this is kept rigid, fixed in space. Then we take our second molecule, which we call ligand. For that one, we're going to sample all possible rotations, and then we're going to do the translational search using FFT-based docking. And then we are doing counting, basically. So for each solution that we generate, we count, does it satisfy the distance restraint, yes or no? And this is done directly during the FFT search. And then you can visualize the accessible space around your receptor, which is consistent with a number of restraints. So this is an example where you have the receptor. <coughs> you see an orange point. This is the center of mass of the second molecule in the crystal structure of the complex. So that's where the true solution is. And the gray area is the area where you can put this center of mass while satisfying five of the distance restraints that we defined. These are these not very accurate cross-linking distance, upper limit 30 angstrom. So you see there's a large space which satisfies the information that you have. Again, no energetics. If you add more data, so now we're looking at seven restraints, you see that the space is shrinking. If there is no space which is consistent with the data that you're looking at, you know you have a problem. You must have inconsistent data, or there is a large conformational change. That could be the other problem. This is rigid body analysis, so there is no conformational change. So can we detect those false positive data in such a case? This is such an example. Uh, RNA polymerase 2, uh, we know the complex. There are six experimental crosslinks that have been described in literature, and we added two false positive ones. So the upper limit for this distance is 30 angstrom. That's what we're using. We added one which is 42 angstrom and one which is 36 angstrom. So in principle, this should not be possible. And then the question is, using this type of analysis, are we able to recover those false positives? Now, this is uh, some statistics of, the, of what's happening. So, this is the, so these are all the solutions in which the two molecules are in contact. Okay, so that's not the number of solutions that we sample, but these are all the solutions where in the, they are in contact. Our sampling was a one angstrom grid side and 5.3 degree rotations. So this is a very large number. So this is 190 billion solutions. Okay. Now you start adding restraints and you see that this is shrinking, but it's not shrinking very fast. Look at three distance restraints. We still have 300 million solutions that are possible that are consistent with free distance restraints. If you add accurate distance restraints, the perfect measurement, there should only be one solution possible. Okay, if you want to orient two planes, think of mathematics, a plane is described by three points. So if you measure a free distance between two, the, 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 the two planes, you are able to orient exactly the plane how they should be. And that will be the same for protein, protein or for biomolecule interactions. But our distance are not accurate. They have this upper limit, 30 angstrom, and the lower limit is basically zero. So you have a, lar a large interval. And as you go down, so now at six, we have still five million solutions that are consistent. Seven, 10,000, eight, zero. Okay, so if you use all the data, you have no single consistent solution. So you know you have a problem. And now the question is, can we identify those? So what we're going to do is actually look at those 10,000 solutions here. So we start from the bottom, we look at those 10,000 and we look which distance out of the eight is most often violated in those 10,000 solutions. Okay, so you can calculate a fraction of violation for each distance restraints that you have in your set. And this is what is shown in this table. So this is the number of restraints that you are looking at. So for eight, there was zero models. So for seven distance, we have 10,000 models to look at. And then you see which distance is most often violated. You see that number eight is always violated. Okay? It's not consistent with any solution, basically. So we have identified our first false positive. Now you can go back and now look at five million solutions and do the same analysis. And if you do that, you see that there are now number seven and eight, which start to be highly violated. Seven is 99.7. And if you now look further up in this matrix, you see that there are 
the variation start to be spread over the, over the matrix. Now you can do some statistics, calculate average set score, and we came up with a way of basically uh, predicting which one are the, the false positive. When you do this analysis, there is another benefit. Okay? If you have consistent data, uh, you have this distance information, but you can also look at all the consistent models that you generated and basically look at the interface that are used in those models when the protein interacted. Okay? So you can count which residue on the surface is most often making contact with the other molecule. So you're doing a surface mapping of the interface, which is consistent with the data, the distances that you put in. And this is defining the surface of a protein, which in principle you could use in your modeling as well. Okay, so now you're extracting information, you're deriving information from the distance information into more like an interface information. Now this is available as a web portal. It's making use of a GP GPU computing for speeding up the search. And the portal is giving you a guided interpretation of the results where we are flagging the possible false positive restraints, uh, color coding them based on some z-score calculation. And you get this view of the accessible space as function of the number of restraints. So these are pre-calculated view. These are not interactive view. But you can get an idea before you were to use those data for any modeling. Are the data consistent, at least? This is not limited to crossing data. This is an example of how the space changes using now NMR data. These are nuclear over Isaac distances. So here we have a set of 56 distances, and we are just decreasing, showing how the interaction space, the accessible space, shrinks as function of the number of distances. NMR NOE distances are much more accurate than crossings. Still, it's amazing to see if you see halfway here, you have 25 distance restraints, and there's still a huge space which is accessible. Again, there's no energetics here, it's purely geometry. And if you put all the data in there, you, you converge to the one solution, which is actually the NMR structure of this complex. So uh, this kind of approach allows you to visualize the information content in principle of any type of data, distance-based information. It allows you to identify possible false positive. Uh, of course, it's a rigid body docking approach, so if you are dealing with conformational changes, that's not going to work very well. So now we have about 50 minutes left for questions or another topic. So these are the multiple choices, okay? So I told you about 20 topics. I hope you can read them, so I give you one minute and then we vote. Some of them we already handled, so you can forget about uh, what is it? Uh, the DSVIS thing is somewhere there. Uh, MS data we already handled. And then uh, this one we also handled. Okay. So we have time for one. Okay. And, and maybe this afternoon, if the tutorial is goes too fast, we might do another one. But yeah. Okay. So. What would you choose? So who calls? First shot. Anyone is, well, maybe you are fed up with me and we stop and we go for lunch. That's also okay. Yes. Protein DNA. Protein DNA. Another suggestion. Yes. Peptides. Anyone else interested in something else? Yes. Antibody antigen. So three topics. Binding affinity. Four topics. I think we should stop here because it's coming. So, so. You had your chance if you didn't call then. So now we have four. So who is four? So we are, sorry? You may have another two hours if you yeah, want. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so we had, uh, who is for protein nucleic acid? Uh, only one vote, though. Okay. Who is for protein nucleic acid? Raise your hand. Oh, bad luck. Huh? Two, protein peptides. Uh, that's one, two, three, four, six. Okay. Uh, binding affinity. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. And then the last one was, uh, yeah, antibody antigens. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, so that's, uh, so yeah, but you don't count. Okay, students. So it seems like the binding affinity story as the, is the winner. And then antibody antigen is number two, so maybe later on uh, this afternoon we can cover it, uh, depending on time. Okay, so I have to find where it is now. Um, 
binding affinities are down there. Why is my mouse? Hmm. No. Do you see a mouse somewhere? Ah, this is not good. Ah, here it is. Binding affinity, yes. Okay. So binding affinity is uh, there's probably too much information, so I would have to skip a few things. So a dream will be to use docking. So assume we have all the proteins in a proteome. So you could think, I'm going to use docking. I'm going to dock everything against everything. And some people have been trying to do that, actually. You have a few papers reporting that. It has not been very successful so far. Or if it was successful, it was for the wrong reason. Uh, no comment here. So you could dock everything against everything, but that's not going to give you so the, the, the answer. That's not going to predict your interactor. Scoring function, so we didn't speak much about scoring function in terms of binding affinity, but they do not correlate with binding affinity. For sure, not for protein proteins. Maybe in small molecule field it's different, but for protein protein, not. I'm going to show you that. So if you have all those models, so assuming your scoring is perfect, you're going to get the best model for each complex that you, you predict. You will have to predict the binding affinity because the binding affinity is going to define if the complex is going to take place in real life or not, depending on the concentration of the proteins in a cell. So you also need to know the concentration if you want to do all of that. So uh, what we started doing at the time, and that's the work of Panos, uh, former PhD student, is say, okay, let's, we're not going to do this docking exercise. That's way too much time. Let's take crystal structure. So we know we have, in principle, the perfect structure, maybe crystal state, but that's our reference point. So given the perfect structure, can we predict the binding affinity of the complex? Okay, that's the question we want to answer. So we need a benchmark for that. So you need to find cases where, again, you have the free form structure of your proteins, you have the structure of the complex, and we have binding affinity data. And that's not simple to put together because the binding affinity data tends to be buried in papers. Um, so in a collaboration between several groups in the docking field, we put out this benchmark, uh, and it has been updated since. So here we had about 140 entries. And then using this benchmark, we calculated uh, we, the scores for different scoring functions in docking. So we have our own ad hoc score, but we use Rosetta, Z-Rank, Attract, uh, PISA server, which is used by the PDB. And we basically calculated the correlation with those binding affinities. And to make a long story short, this is what you're getting, an R square of zero. Okay? No correlation between scoring function and binding affinity. This is also the reason why in Haddock we never put units to our scores. Okay? These are arbitrary units. We don't want people to think that this is a binding affinity. And these are some of the correlations that you are getting if you are doing this exercise. So there are some of them look better than others, but there is no predicting power in any of those scoring functions if you look at those graphs. So ad hoc is in there. Uh, so some of them are, are not, if you take a subset of the data, you start seeing correlation. So this is the best function, and it gives you an R of minus 0.5, not R squared, but R, okay? Now, this puts you in this gray area in terms of correlations, and this is, again, if you want to do predictions based on that, it still looks very much like potatoes, your distribution of points no predictive power. So the first model of binding affinity was uh, from uh, Horton and Lewis. It was published in 92. At the time, they had 10 complexes, and they were getting correlations of 0.9 between the buried surface area of the complex and the binding affinity. Okay, so the amount of surface at the interface was correlating very strongly with the binding affinity. Now, if you use the same model, uh, you can retrain the model using the data that we have now, 140 complex. You get for the BSA uh, correlation of about 0.53. And the best energetic model, very fancy energy function, gives you about the same values. Okay, so you can simply take BSA as a proxy of binding affinity and you get about 0.5. And these correlations, they only hold 
for the complex that are characterized as rigid binders. So there are no conformational changes upon binding. And here the limit was put at one angstrom. Okay, so if there's less than one angstrom conformational changes, um, we, we qualify it as rigid binder. So you get this correlation. Point five, if you look at all the system where there are larger conformational changes, your correlations are gone. So that's bad news for these simple methods. So what are you missing here? Uh, many things. Uh, there might be limitation in the quality of the data. Again, so these sets of data, they have been measured in different labs by different methods. So it, it, it will be extremely nice for the field to have a data set measured in a consistent way on a large set of complexes. It's simply not there. Uh, there might be ambiguity of crystal coordinates. We might be missing cofactors. We might be missing water, maybe, uh, ions, so the solvent. And what we are doing, when we're doing docking, we usually score only on the bound state. We neglect the free state in most cases. This is a free energy landscape. This is a reaction coordinate. So here we have the free states, and here we have the complex. So here I have a complex of a sphere with a triangle, and I have a complex of a triangle with a square. In terms of uh, free energy, they have the same free energy in their bond state, but they have different binding affinities because their free states are different. Okay, so part of the equation, part of the problem, if you want to predict this, if you're doing scoring and you score on the interface, you're going to predict the same binding affinity for those two. Because in this case, in this example, the answer is actually in a free state. So uh, in doing this work, we also uh, discovered quite interesting correlations. Uh, namely, that there is also a correlation between binding affinity and the percentage of polar amino acid on the non-interacting surface. So the surface of the contact of the complex, which is not involved in a binding. And that's surprising. And you also have these correlations with the percentage of charge amino acid. So for the, you get about minus 40, 0.48 for the charge one and 0.42 for the polar one. Of course, correlation, correlation doesn't mean anything. Okay, so it's not because there is a correlation, there is a causality. There is a very strong correlation between eating chocolate and winning the Nobel Prize. Okay, so if you calculate what's the average consumption of chocolate per inhabitant per country, and you correlate that against the Nobel Prize, the number of Nobel Prize winner, Switzerland is on top of that uh, correlation, you get a correlation of 0.9 or something. Okay, is there a causality? Probably not. I still like chocolate, you never know, but uh, so, and you are in Switzerland, so you should not live without some chocolate. So, okay. So we observe correlations that are kind of surprising. So, and uh, if you see that, you say, oh, you know, electrostatic, that's the on rate. You change the properties of the surface, the, the complex is going to assemble more faster. I hope you know that binding affinity is the ratio of the on and off rate. So how fast does the complex form and how fast or so how slow does the complex dissociate? So if it was the on rate, you would ex expect to observe those correlations with the on rate, but this is the on rate, no correlation, and this is the off rate, a much stronger correlation. So that's strange also. So uh, I don't want to spend too much time uh, going over all the details, uh, but we analyzed uh, all of that. And there is an explanation uh, actually for, for, for the different effects. So first of all, if there is a causality to it, the properties of the surface should be conserved along evolution. If you look at different complexes, uh, in evolution. And this is what we looked at. So we have a subset of 44 complexes that are non-redundant complexes. So there is no uh, sequence similarity between those. And you see, the, you see polar and charge, blue and red, and these vary greatly. Now, if you take one complex and then you go look along evolutions for homologous complexes, this is the percentage of sequence identity. You see this is much more conserved. And you can measure what is the average and standard deviation of those values. And if you do that over the entire set, you can do it by building a homology model, but you can also do it simply from sequence. And you see that uh, the standard deviations for the non-homologous complexes, those guys, is always much larger than the for homologous one. And we went down to about 30% sequence identity. So there seems to be something in evolutions that says that the surfaces of those proteins have been conserved to some extent. 
And these are global properties. Um, so then we had some explanation about uh, the different uh, reason why polar. Uh, again, I don't want to spend too much time now, but polarity is linked to the solvent shell. So they are, for example, uh, antifreeze proteins that have a high percentage of serine and threonine on their surface. And this is affecting the network of hydrogen bonds with water, preventing water to freeze, actually. So by increasing the polarity of the surface, you are stabiliz stabilizing the water shell around your complex. And this is protecting the complex from you know, bumping into other molecules, which you need energy to lead to dissociation. So, and this energy has to come from somewhere in solution. So if you stabilize the water shell of your complex, you are protecting it from interactions that might give you the energy needed to dissociate. Okay? And the charge effect is a long, the interface of your complex is basically sensitive to what's happening on the surface, to the charge. And you can demonstrate that using a simple electrostatic model. So using all of that, we basically uh, came up with a model of binding affinity for predicting, where we say, of course, the interface is still important. Okay? So that's the primary uh, kind of feature which is important to predict affinities, but you also have to consider the properties of the surface of your complex. So we came, so this is the classical interface model from uh, Horton and Lewis, which uh, discriminate between polar and apolar surface area at the interface. And we came with a model which still has the interface, but now we also calculate properties of the surface. So this is the number of atoms at the interface. This is a proxy of the buried surface area. And then we have the percentage of charge residue on the non-interacting surface and the percentage of polar residue on the non-interacting surface. So this is our model. And this is what it's giving. So Horton and Lewis gives you 0.5, the best energetic model that we tested. And these are not free energy calculation was giving you 0.5 as well. So now we are 0.64, so it's slightly better. And this was as good as it was getting at the time. And you also start seeing correlations for the complexes that are changing conformations uh, during binding. Uh, so this is all a model. So is there experimental evidence that actually this is happening? So we went to look into database of uh, mutations where people have been measuring changes in binding affinity upon mutation. And we classify the mutations as function of their distance from the interface. Okay, so if there is a contribution of this non-interacting surface to the binding, you should see mutations on the surface that are away from the interface and still causing changes in binding affinities. And this is what you are seeing here. So this is you are at the interface. So here you have huge changes. But as you move away, so this will be five angstrom from the interface. You see you go up to about four kcal per mole, but you can go up to about 12 angstrom and you still see mutations that might go up to 1.5 kcal per mole. So there are data out there that are indicating that this uh, model is not so crazy. Uh, and then, just a few slides and then I stop. Uh, we revisited this and we came with another model which was even simpler in a sense. Uh, this is the work of Anna Van Gorn in a group where we basically have been looking at the number of contact at the interface. So we're just counting the number of residue, residue contact at the interface, classify those as polar, 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 apolar. So we have different types of contact. Train a model, basically. And uh, let me see. OK, so this is the final model. So the final model contains the contact at the interface, but it also contains the non-interacting surface. So the polar and up, uh, the polar and charge residues. And the model now gets a correlation of 0.73. Uh, we had 0.64 with our non-interacting surface slash BSA model. So we have improved this a bit. And if you compare this model with all the other functions that were available at the time out there, uh, so you see here uh, Defire, Rosetta is there, PyDoc, so different models. So this is this contact-based non-interacting surface model. So we're getting correlations around 0.73. And the good thing of the model that it's also very robust for the flexible complexes. While all the other models have a hard time to predict the flexible complexes where there are conformational changes, this model seems to, to capture that quite well. 
Since, uh, so this was published in 2015. Since then, there have been other works that confirmed also the non-interacting surface independently. And there have been slightly improved models, but I think 0.75 is probably the best that you can get today with this kind of fast approaches. The advantage of this one, it's extremely fast. You just need to, contact, to, to calculate contacts. And that's one of the server that we are providing, Prodigy, where you basically upload a PDB file and it's going to give you the predicted affinity. Okay, with that, we go back here. And in sake of time, we should conclude. So hopefully I have convinced you that using data when you have them, and there might be much more data that you think which is valuable to model complexes, is uh, very useful to generate models. Uh, what we are doing in all the modeling uh, that we are doing, we're generating models. You should also realize that everything which is in a PDB, even all the crystal structure, they are all models. There is no single structure of a protein in a PDB which is not a model. Some of them are more models than others. But even in crystallography at high resolution, the bond length are defined by the model. The angles are defined by the model. So there is always a bit of modeling going in any experimental crystal structure, and NMR structure and cryo-EM structure. So everything is a model. Some are more model than others. So the models are not going to be fully accurate, but they are valuable to generate hypotheses. And with these hypotheses, you can go back to the lab, do experiment, and test the model. Uh, so in that respect, information-driven docking is very complementary to classical structural methods. So I need to thank the people who have been uh, involved in the work over the years. So this is a picture of the group uh, last year. Um, I also want to acknowledge funding from different European projects over the years to support our efforts with uh, BioXL in particular and the European Open Science Cloud being an ongoing project and also the Dutch Research Council of Dortmund. And with that, oh, these are the ad hoc developers over the year from networking events, everything about interactions. Uh, if you are an experimentalist uh, and you are uh, generating structure of complexes, please contribute to the CAPFRI experiments. We are always looking for new targets. Uh, so we depend on experimental people. So if some of you are doing that, then consider that. Another point, uh, when you do modeling, you cannot deposit, uh, de deposit those models typically in databases. That's another limitation or problem. So you, have to, you want to share the data. I think if you publish papers about models, you should make your data available so that other people can use your model. So now if you are doing integrative modeling, so you have been using some kind of data to generate a model, the PDB has been working to build a repository of such models. Uh, it's called PDB Dev. At some point in the future, it's going to be absorbed by the standard PDB repositories, but you cannot deposit those integrative models that are coming from a combination of techniques. Uh, we deposited one set when we have been doing some cryo-EM modeling there. Uh, so again, if you are generating models based on some data, there is a way of sharing that with other people now and depositing them. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you, Alexander, very much for your extensive and clear presentation. So we have a few time for questions. Hello, thanks for the talk. I have a question uh, about uh, the scoring uh, procedure in the ad hoc protocol. There is uh, the scoring at each step of the protocol, at the end of one of each step. Yes, yeah, so, th so we have three different stages, and the first one is the rigid docking stage. So we have a different scoring function at that stage than at the final stage. The final stage, the interface are optimized because we allow for flexibility. So in, the, in a rigid body docking stage, we use the buried surface area, for example, in a scoring function. So the amount of surface and the van der Waals interactions are scaled down because they are not going to be very good anyway. So we use uh, buried surface area instead of the van der Waals as a weight. And the weights are also changed because uh, we also, th the treatment of electrostatic interactions is also different at different stages. So the default protocol will be that we use, um, we scale down the electrostatic by a factor 10 during our calculations when we are in the first and second stage. And when we go to water, we have the full electrostatic again. 
and this also affects the weight <coughs> that you are using. So each stage has different weight, but the most important one are the rigid body one, uh, because there we do a first selection, and you don't want to lose model in that selection, and then everything that goes from that uh, first selection, everything goes all the way to the end. So the final weight is the, uh, the relevant one. So if you use the server, what you are being presented are the final weights of the water refinement stage. Okay, thank you. Any other question? And you still have a chance to ask questions this afternoon, of course. Okay. We have uh, a question about the scoring function again. So have you considered to uh, make uh, a scoring function that works uh, only with a certain kind of protein-protein uh, interaction, for instance, uh, antibody-antigen? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so we have not been following this approach. I know that some software are doing that. Um, First of all, you, will, you need enough data. Uh, so in the benchmark that we are using, we have about, you know, the current docking benchmark, which you use in a field has about 230 complexes. And maybe, I don't know, 40 or 50, of, or probably 40 of those might be antibody antigens. So it's a small set, but you could optimize for that. Um, we decided not to do uh, for several reasons, because we are, so we are multi-body also docking ability. So you might be docking a system where you have a protein-protein interface binding to a DNA. So then you have different types of interfaces. And if you're going to have scoring functions which are interface specific, that makes everything very complicated. So we like the fact that we have a rather simple function, but you score peptides in the same way that you score nucleic acids and protein-protein interface. The only thing that we started changing now is for small molecule docking, where we, we have a, a different set of parameters uh, that we recommend for that. Uh, so you could do it, but we, we choose not to. Again, we, over the years we have been optimizing and some people, they wanted to revisit protein peptide or protein nucleic acid, and at the end they were still converging to numbers that were very close to the numbers that we use now. So again, if it's 0.9, then make it one, and it looks much nicer on paper. Okay, and the accuracy is not that high anyway. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Thank you, first of all. Uh, I have a couple of questions, but just want to make you one because of the time. They are tired, the lunch time. Uh, so I would like to stay on the scoring function mm -hmm. <laughs> because one of my questions was on scoring function. About your combination, the intermezzo. So the combination between cosgrain and uh, yes. adocrio. Uh, we know that Marti we also use Martini, it's enthalpically driven. So how do you deal with this enthalpy? Uh, I would say, uh, overestimation in the scoring function or, or in finding the dimers? So I, I'm not sure if there's that much overestimation of enthalpy in Martini, at least in what we are doing. So there's one thing. So Martini has very few electrostatics, okay? So we are losing on the electrostatic, and maybe you are winning on the Van der Waals somewhere. Uh, so so it's, it's not clear. I think the other point to make, and when you, at the end, we score all atom. So when uh, the, the, the end of a protocol is just morphing back the coarse grain model to all atoms, so then we are using the same scoring function. In the rigid body phase, we have not been re-optimizing our scoring function. Maybe we should, but we have not yet done that. Uh, I think another important point when you think of ad hoc is since we typically use data to drive the docking, the scoring function maybe becomes a bit less uh, critical in a sense. If you don't have data, then you are in trouble because we, we, we see that our sampling maybe is good, but we are losing them in our scoring. So we need to probably revisit scoring at the Martini level. Uh, but again, the data are saving us in, in, in many cases. Thank you. Uh, last one is practical one. You present about the PDB dev database is very nice with something similar with the Proven Nest recently with the enhanced sampling simulations. How do you access the quality of the data? Because the point is that you can deposit a new structure, but how can we, uh, the user can be, no? Can yes. be assured that's that's that the, the yeah. quality, yeah. 
for to also in the view that you said it will be merged in the future in the PDP. Yeah. So how you, yeah. my question is. Uh, so that's an active uh, field of research. So there's a task force of the PDB. There's an integrative modeling task force of PDB. Uh, I'm a member of that one. So we had two meetings so far. And one of the, so the goal of the meetings is to define metrics to assess those, those models. Because now in the database, there is no metric. Okay, now you can deposit things. Uh, there have been recommendations published also. Uh, Andre Sally is very instrumental in this work. Uh, there's another uh, kind of white paper which has been submitted to structures. So this should appear probably in the next months where there are recommendations about what to assess. But there is no validation part yet in the deposition system. You would expect that the data, the model should fulfill the, the basic chemistry. So basically, you know, chemistry, stereochemistry, but that's easy to fool when you do modeling. Uh, they should explain the data, but it's not yet clear what should be the criteria. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes uh, and I think also the, the idea here in this integrative model, you should be able to, to submit multiple solutions. Mm -hmm. So we have in the new version of the portal, we, we want to facilitate the position. So we are actually working toward generating MMC format for integrative models. And ideally, we would like to put in that all the cluster that you get with the different scores, mm -hmm. because this is what your model gives you and not just pick one model. Uh, but then that's so, so that, that will be the future. But that's, yeah. uh, that's work in progress uh, at yeah. the worldwide level, say. No, but I believe this is the direction where to go also yeah. in terms of our community or yeah. sampling, do the, the same. Uh, but you know, in the past also, Andre Shali, I'm very glad yeah. to hear from you because the model base was on the first example of kind of database to, mm -hmm. to, to put uh, uh, model structure, but the reliability of those structures depends on the yeah. by the user. So this is yeah. a critical point that yeah. we should also for us, for, for the plumeness nest yeah. as well. Uh, it's yeah. a critical point if you want to be no, uh, believed by the experimentalists yeah. or the yeah. uh, people. Again, I think so, so the model should make sense in terms of stereochemical. The same validation that are applied to crystal structure are going probably to be applied to those models, depending on resolution, because if you have a coarse grain model, then you cannot apply the same. But it's not because you fulfill those data, those, those uh, requirements that your model is correct. So the, 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 the assessment of the data that went in is an important part, but that's not going to be simple because we also need some unified format so that you can develop tools that are going to assess. So that's, on, there's on a long way to go. On the other end, we may say the same for the experimental structure because yeah. the different groups may have different structures depending on the experimental conditions. So there are variables, yeah. The, yeah. but the most things to check that the things are done at the state of the art. Mm -hmm. So I totally agree, yeah. thank you. I have a technical curiosity about probably mainly protein peptide interactions. So, mm -hmm. how do does Haddock deal with no standard residue? Have you special libraries or? Oh, Haddock deals with uh, non-standard residues. Non-standard so yeah. residues. So we have uh, we have support for a number of non-standard residues. I'm going to I can show that in, in the afternoon. So there's a link where you can find what is supported. So we have phosphorylated, acetylated, methylated, a number of those sulfonated. Uh, we didn't systematically add those, but we added them to the library when we needed them or when a user was asking for it. But there's already quite an extended list of modified amino acids that are supported. When people ask for new ones, it depends very much how easy it is to, uh, to add them. Okay. Yeah, but they, they are there. And then you will have, a, actually we'll see in the tutorial an example of a phosphorylated histidine and how you have to give it to the, to the portal. Great. So, tired, I'm tired. Yes. <laughs> hungry. Thank you. So thank okay. you again, thank you. Alexander. <laughs> so let's go for lunch and we will be back at uh, room 1556.